Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad to be here. Good to see you tonight. You got plenty to talk about. Plenty to talk about. We're trying this new way of doing things out. We're doing uh, two in a day, right? We'll just see how it goes, right? I don't expect the numbers to be as big. Uh, however, I expect that uh, I'll speak to different people, right? Some people are up during these hours and different parts of the world, etc. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Let's do it. Of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything will be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. All right, welcome everybody. So glad that you're here tonight watching this stream. Um, a lot of great things that we can talk about. Um, the way this generally works, uh, I give my opening remarks. My opening remarks are then followed by a roll call uh, where I call out people as I see them, names and locations, names and locations. And then from there, I answer your super chat or rumble rant or rockfin tip questions for the rest of the night. Uh, so if you got something you want me to talk about in the second half of our program, send me a rumble rant, send me a rockfin tip, send me a super chat, whichever suits your boat, whichever floats your boat. Uh, that's the way we do it. Um, so I just kind of give opening remarks, the uh, the questions, comments, you know, things for me to react to in the second half come in as I'm talking. And then from there, uh, I do the roll call and then I answer them in the second half. Uh, so there we go, folks. Well, as you are all aware, uh, things have really escalated in the Middle East. And I talked about it a little bit on the stream uh, earlier today, and I'm talking about it again. Um, the line of people that are defending Israel is they're claiming that what Hamas is doing right now is, quote unquote, unprovoked, unprovoked. And so a uh, friend sent me a pretty well put together refutation of that claim. This is, Israel has spent 75 years committing apartheid and genocide against the Palestinian people. So this was not an unprovoked attack. This was an act of resistance against a brutal occupying force. Uh, we have Palestine in 1947. We have the UN plan of 1947. We have 1949 to 1967. And we have 2005. And as you can see, the Palestinians are gradually losing their territory, they, you know, the settlements, etc. They're just being constantly pushed into less and less of a territory. They used to have the whole country, except for there were a few settlements there. And gradually they're being pushed off our land. If this doesn't look like a provocation, I don't know what is. Uh, so to call what the Palestinians are doing unprovoked, um, it's very similar to what they've said about Ukraine, isn't it? Right. You know, uh, the war in Ukraine is if somehow uh, that was just completely unprovoked as well. This is the game uh, that the imperialists love to play. They like to call things unprovoked, unprovoked. Um, there we go. So I wanted to get that out of the way. And so I thought, um, you know, since we are uh, talking about a topic that is important and since we have certain mantras on here that are very important, I would then highlight uh, a passage from Mao Zedong that is particularly meaningful for me in situations like this. When I think of the Palestinian people and their continued resistance, uh, this is this is from Mao, one of his final statements, people of the world united defeat the U.S. aggressors and their running dogs. Innumerable facts prove that a just cause enjoys abundant support, while an unjust cause finds little support. A weak nation can defeat a strong, a small nation 
can defeat a big. The people of a small country can surely defeat aggression by a big country. If only they dare to rise in struggle, dare to take up arms and grasp in their own hands the destiny of their country. This is a law of history. The people of the world unite and defeat the U.S. aggressors and their running dogs. That's one of Mao's final statements that he gave. Mao died in 1976, but uh, I think this statement was published in about 1970. He wasn't giving many statements. He was pretty old after about 1970, um, you know, uh, and uh, this is one of his final statements. And it gave birth to a very, um, you know, Cornelius Cardu, one of my favorite um, Marxist uh, music uh, composers. He used these words to compose a, a beautiful piece of writing. So I thought in honor of the Palestinian people uh, and the struggle that is taking place right now uh, as the occupiers face the heroic resistance of the Palestinians, we would put on uh, Law of History.
So that is my tribute to the Palestinian people and their heroic resistance to Zionism and U.S. imperialism as they surge forward. The people of the world will be victorious. Imperialism is doomed. Uh, At this point, uh, there's no question about that. Um, So on a somewhat lighter note, uh, you know, it's still important. I thought um, I would put on uh, David Rovix, uh, who is a friend of mine a great musician. I have loved his music for years. And then getting to know David Rovix in real life has been a real honor. Uh, David Rovix, uh, today, he put out a call. Uh, He made a 10-point statement of principles, uh, a a beautiful statement uh, denouncing cancel culture. And we uh, at the Center for Political Innovation have signed it. Uh, We have signed it. I've signed it personally. Um, And rather than read it to you myself, and you're on the list, great questions coming in. I thought I would just put on David Rovix, uh, the great musician. Uh, I would put on his, uh, official, um, you know, his, his statement. Um, you know, uh, because it's really important because leftist circles have been completely co-opted by cancel culture. I mean, there's just way too much virtue signaling and internet harassment campaigns and not enough activism actually taking place amid all this childish bickering and internet cancel culture. So this is David Rovix putting forward his 10 point statement of principles. And I hope uh, that I will inspire other people to sign this statement as well. Um, And David Rovix, uh, I'm sure he will be presenting. He already agreed to present this statement of principles at our upcoming uh, CPI conference in Portland, Oregon, where he lives. So this is David Rovix, and I'll I'll interrupt to comment on it uh, because it's a really important statement of principles he put out. This is his call. Statement of principles. Is the left mainly a bunch of censorship-happy, empire-supporting, virtue-signaling clowns? Or is it just, or is that just the impression we get from social media? You can find this in written form at davidrovix.com slash principles. What gets called the left in U.S. society and others is a contradictory and confusing phenomenon. People who identify their political orientation with words like anarchism, communism, socialism, social democracy may support exclusive and even authoritarian policies and organizing tactics while others identifying with supposedly the same ideologies engage in inclusive forms of organizing and support things like open discourse and free expression. What gets called the left may include people involved with organizing workers, tenants, or members of other communities of people to stand up against the nefarious plans of the capitalists. But it also will tend to include a lot of people engaged in grandstanding, showboating, virtue signaling, and cancellation campaigning on corporate social media platforms. Who are the people that believe in and maybe even engaged 
who are the people that believe in and are maybe even engaged in effective organizing? And who are the ones throwing virtual bombs into every space where such organizing is trying to happen? The corporate advertisers and political dividers know who we all are, but we don't know each other. If you agree with the basic orientation represented by the 10 no-brainer points below and you'd like to put your name to a public statement to that effect, email me at david at davidrovics.com with your name and any other relevant info to put along with it, such as your occupation or organization you may represent. When, we, when we've got a good collection of names, we'll add them to this statement and publish it in other places. In case it's not abundantly obvious already, if you have come to agree with these points only very recently and up until last month you were acting like a horrible troll on Twitter, you're just as beautiful a human being and we want you. Also, if you're generally in support of these points but have suggestions for improving the presentation or content of them, or if you have profound disagreements with any of them that you might like to tell me about in an email, I'm interested in those emails too. 1. We embrace organizing for a purpose and reject showboating and performative virtue signaling. Organizing is about building networks, finding common ground, establishing common goals. Boasting about who is pure enough for you to have contact with and who isn't has nothing to do with organizing and much better serves the purpose of disorganizing. Yes. Yes. The point is to win. The point is to win. The point isn't to be right on the internet. The point isn't to expose someone else on the internet for not being as pure as you are. The point is to win. Point number one, full agreement with David Rovex. The point is to achieve the stated goal. The point is not to performatively virtue signal on the internet. Two. We embrace real justice and reject anonymous attacks intended to smear people. Although people may commit terrible offenses and holding people accountable for their behavior may be very important, anonymous attacks, smear campaigns, and vigilante justice is a terrible way to seek justice or accountability and is a perfect tool for use by nefarious actors, especially when broadly accepted by a knee-jerk, believe-the-victim-no-matter-what mentality that has been instilled in much of the population. Three. Yes, the idea that somehow the way we're going to make our activist circles better or we're going to make things better is by harassing people, by doxing people, by, you know, anonymously spreading rumors about people, exaggerating things. That's going to somehow advance the struggle to get to socialism, to defeat U.S. imperialism. I don't think so. Full agreement on point number two from David Rovix. We embrace diversity and we reject identitarianism. Diversity of all kinds in society is a wonderful thing to be celebrated, not just tolerated. And that has nothing to do with the tokenistic oppression Olympics that has taken over left discourse. We must not let our diversity get used against us like this, as a tool for divide and conquer, as a means of getting us all to squabble over crumbs dropped from the tables of the billionaires. Yes. We celebrate the fact that there are men and women, people of diverse ethnic, cultural, national backgrounds, people of different ages, people of different abilities, uh, you know, people of different sexual orientations and identities. We celebrate the fact there are there are a diversity of people around, but we're done with tokenizing people. We're done with with this performance of, oh, you know, you're a racist because you said the wrong word. We're done with that. We want people of different nationalities, different backgrounds. We want diversity in our circles, but we're done with performative identitarianism. Or we embrace free discourse and reject no platforming. No platforming is a long-standing, inherently authoritarian tendency rife in certain areas of the left over the past century or so, in modern times more known by variations to the theme, such as cancellation campaigning or cancel culture. It is a sort of grassroots form of censorship. It has consistently backfired everywhere from a purely pragmatic standpoint. It's a tactic easily exploited by nefarious actors, and it's morally repugnant for anyone who believes in free speech. 
five. Yes. Yes. At this point, the, the no platforming is being used by the imperialists. It's being used to shut down dissent. It's being used to silence uh, people with legit views. Um, the no platforming stuff is just a vehicle for making sure the imperialists maintain control over left discourse. Uh, they target anti-imperialists. It's, it's got to be opposed. We embrace, we embrace free expression while rejecting corporate control. Freedom of speech is not some bourgeois idea that we should throw out along with imperialism. Freedom of speech is a radical concept that we embrace as, a, as the thing that is obviously preferable to the alternative censorship. We don't want to kick <clears throat> anyone off of any platform <clears throat> for having the wrong opinions. But this is not an endorsement of big tech or their plans for world domination. Their monopolistic practices and conflict-producing algorithms need to be exposed and opposed, but not by making the whole situation worse by calling for people or outlets to be banned from platforms. Yes. Why are we empowering Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Eric Schmidt? Why are we empowering the wealthiest people? to shut down certain ideas and silence dissidents. Why? Why, why, why are we empowering those folks to do that? Why? 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 I mean, if you're a revolutionary, you're an anti-imperialist, why would you want the richest and most powerful people, the tech monopolists of Western capitalist society, to have the right to silence people? Support for no platforming and silencing people uh, by the political establishment among leftists is completely illegitimate. Six, we embrace being the media and reject censorship campaigns. The fact that a handful of gigantic corporations control our means of communication and most of the news we consume is a terrifying fact. We need to do a lot about that by taking on these corporations and the governments that facilitate them in all kinds of ways but not by passing laws allowing governments to censor or throttle content on social media platforms or anywhere else on the internet. Seven. Yes. Again, it's kind of repetitive, but it's the same point. Why are we enabling Western capitalist governments and tech monopolies to silence people? Why would we give them that power? If we claim to be against imperialism, we claim to be against the imperialist states and the imperialist monopolies, why would we want to give them the ability to silence people? We embrace finding common ground and reject efforts to polarize, divide, and cancel. The main point in, ta in talking about things that divide us is not to make some people feel guilty and others feel virtuous. The point is to find ways to work together to achieve common goals despite these divides, and perhaps even to overcome these divides in that process. This is very different from forming subgroups within subgroups in order to further highlight divisions within divisions for no apparent purpose aside from claiming some amorphous form of higher ground. Yes. While it's important to talk about issues, the point is to bring people together, to build a better life for everybody, to find solutions. The point is not to demonize certain people, to make people feel guilty, to, to divide. The point is to bring people together so that we can win. Eight, we embrace communication and education and reject harassment, vilification, doxing, and other personal attacks. Nobody learns from being attacked and harassed. In fact, attacking and harassing people tends to make them angry and cause them to become more entrenched in their feelings or positions. How did the notion become so widespread that harassing and vilifying right-wingers or other people you don't like is, a useful, is useful in any possible way? Yes, yes. Do these people who engage in the harassment campaigns and the cancel culture, do they think we're going to change our positions because we do that? Right. Has anyone ever after years of being called transphobic and being, you know, had been harassed on their job and all of that, has anyone gone, oh, I guess I agree with the trans rights movement? Of course not. Has anybody after years of being harassed for being called a racist said, oh, I guess I am a racist. I was wrong. Of course not. None of this is in any way about persuading people to change. It's just about 
threatening people, intimidating people, making people afraid to speak out. But it's not about actually trying to correct bad ideas or mistaken ideas. It is simply a new form of McCarthyism and terrorism. It does not educate or change things. It just leads to further polarization. Um, you know, if you want people that are conservative or have ideas that you disagree with to change, you can't do it by harassing them, by canceling them. No one ever listens to that. You have to engage with people. People learn and change through dialogue, not through hate campaigns, not through spreading lies about them, not through harassment, not through spreading false rumors and untruths, not through cyberbullying. No one, no one changes their views because of these vicious hate campaigns that are launched by self-righteous internet liberals. It's not. <clears throat> it's the opposite, in fact. It's completely counterproductive. We need to find common ground, build bridges, understand how we're being used, not shout at each other, either online or downtown. Nine, we embrace real organizing and reject word policing and other forms of elitism. Real, effective, <clears throat> useful organizing means diverse people working together to achieve common goals, such as organizing a union at a workplace to collectively demand higher wages or organizing tenants into a tenant union to collectively demand lower rent. Any such group will inherently involve people with all kinds of differences. In order for a group to function, it can't have some kind of vetting process where anyone getting involved has to know all the right vocabulary words in, to use in order not to offend the modern liberal. This is not the way forward. Popular education does not occur in the process of calling people out for using the wrong pronoun or acronym. Yes, yes. Cancel culture is not about really organizing. In order to really accomplish things, you need to bring as many people together as possible to work around the same goals. But if everyone, if you sit there and go, oh, you said this, you're out. Oh, you think this, you're out. Oh, you, you don't accomplish anything. And that's what this showboating, performative, fake organizing is all about. Instead of actually accomplishing anything, it's just a performative thing of who can you punish, who can you exclude, who can you bully, and it's not about actually winning. Actually winning means working with people of diverse perspectives, bringing people together. 10. We embrace the differences of viewpoints and reject ostracizing people who don't share ours. Yes, we can actually form a union with millions of people all calling for the same demands, even though they have different views on who killed Jesus, who invaded Ukraine, who should or shouldn't get an abortion, whether there should ever be drag shows at their local libraries, and all kinds of other vitally important issues. And in fact, this kind of coalition is the only way anything useful ever happens anywhere. Opposing such coalitions on the basis of someone or some group within it having the wrong views on something is a means of dividing and conquering unions, not a way to build anything, and not a way to win hearts and minds of all those whose hearts and minds we, and hopefully not the capitalists and imperialists hell-bent on global domination, need to win. That was David Robick's uh, statement of principles. And I, for one, think it's tremendous. We have signed it, and I'm looking forward to when David Robix will present his principles uh, at the uh, CPI conference. We're going to publish the principles on the website. Uh, I think it's great. He has been subjected to a horrendous smear campaign, and we think it's, it's great that he is pushing forward and standing up against this kind of internet harassment, uh, which is toxic. Um, and uh, if you want to come see David Rovix uh, present his statement, and if you also want to come listen to some really good music, because David Rovix is a great musician, and you also want to hear some great speeches by uh, other people, and you want to just have a general good time, a general good time in Portland, uh, I would encourage you to attend our upcoming conference, Portland, Oregon, December 2nd. Um, um, and it's going to be great. It's going to be a great conference make your travel arrangements, um, make your travel arrangements. Um, and, uh, you, you want to be there. You want to be there. Um, it's going to be great. Uh, make your travel arrangements, um, you know, book your flight or whatever. Uh, David Fox votes in favor of the 10 principles. So do I, um, we all second David's principles. They're a great set of principles and we should circulate David Robix 
um, David Robick's principles. We should circulate them online. Um, and uh, he's going to be at our conference. Um, so I am delighted. I am more than delighted that he's going to be there. I am more than delighted that he's putting out this call. We did something similar with CPI. We did the statement against wrecking. Um, but I think that David Robix uh, is very well connected in activist circles and that this is going to, you know, you know, take more ground. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, and I'm excited that David Robix is going to be there. And I'm excited that he's got these um, he, he's got these principles. Um, and uh, so I am encouraging everyone to come to Portland, to come to Portland, Oregon for our conference. Uh, and if possible, send us a donation to help cover the conference costs. It's going to be more than just one day. Now, the big day is December 2nd. The big day is December 2nd. But December 1st, in the evening, December 1st, we are going to have a world anti-imperialist platform meeting with Jyoti Brar of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist, co-sponsored by the Center for Political Innovation and the Party of Communists USA. It's going to be a great night to celebrate Jyoti Brar and her efforts to bring together communists around the world to oppose what is going on in the imperialist drive toward World War III to stand with Russia and China and People's Korea. That's going to be a great, great evening. Then, December 2nd, we will have our all-day anti-imperialist rally in Portland, Oregon. It's going to be amazing. Then, then December 3rd, there's going to be a very important meeting, which we'll be announcing soon. Not ready to announce it yet. Details on the December 3rd meeting. And then, that following weekend, the following weekend, December 8th, 9th, and 10th, we are going to have a workshop for new members in the Portland area, new members, anyone who really wants to come from around the country, about what the Center for Political Innovation is really all about. It's going to be a tremendous time for everybody. It's going to be tremendous. We're going to have that, that weekend three-day workshop in Portland the following weekend, uh, introductory course into what CPI is about, group activities. It's going to be amazing. We are building a community of resistance here. We are building an anti-imperialist network of people who are opposed to World War III who are opposed to the low-wage police state, and we need you to be a part of it. We need you to be a part of it. We need you to send a donation to help us do it. We need you. We need you. Um, so um, it's going to be a great, uh, great early December. The first few days, the first you know, 10 or so days of, um, of December uh, are going to be pretty awesome. We are going to close out 2023 with a bang. Uh, it's going to be quite exciting. The Pacific Northwest is going to have a lot of Center for Political Innovation activity in it. Uh, we are so excited about it. So, um, excuse, <coughs> excuse me, had to sneeze there. These fall allergies, but um, it's going to be great. It's going to be absolutely great and tremendous. We need you there. We absolutely need you there. We need you to donate to help us do it. And we need you to, to fill the room. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're going to fill that auditorium. There's going to be 250 people there for a mega anti-imperialist rally. It's going to be awesome. It is going to be absolutely tremendous. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. Now the next part of these live streams, the next section, uh, that I want to do here, um, the next section here, um, this is. This is going to be interesting. Um, now, I recently uh, have been pulling up quotes from from Lenin, um, quotes from quotes from Lenin about organizing that we can learn from. Um, and I'm I'm going to go through. There's a, a important book that Vladimir Lenin wrote, uh, and he wrote it. Um, he wrote this book. Um, he wrote it. Um, He wrote this book. Uh, it's called Two Tactics. Two Tactics in the Two Tactics of Social Democracy in the Democratic Revolution. And it was a polemic against the forces in Russia that thought that in the name of opposing the czar's government and fighting for bourgeois democracy, they should tone down the socialism. Um, and that was that was their argument that the Mensheviks and other forces said that because in Russia they were fighting against czarist autocracy and against feudalism, 
that in order to do so, since they were fighting for, you know, kind of basic bourgeois civil liberties against feudalism, they should tone down the socialist aspect of what they were doing. Um, and the reason was because that would alienate the bourgeoisie. It would alienate the capitalists who might be on their side. And Lenin wrote this book called Two Tactics of Social Democracy. And the book ends with a very, very poetic closing statement called Dare We Win? Dare We Win? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a long statement that goes over a lot of things, but the final paragraphs of it are very, very poetic. And I thought we would just go over the final paragraphs of Dare We Win, the closing section of Two Tactics. This is 1905, Lennon wrote this pamphlet. So we're going we're gonna to go over them. Um, we're going to go over the, uh, the final paragraphs of this important essay. All right. As the representatives of the advanced and only revolutionary class, revolutionary without reservations, doubts, or looking back, we must present the, to the whole of the people as widely and boldly and with utmost initiative possible the task of the democratic revolution. To degrade these tasks in theory means making a travesty of Marxism, distorting in Philistine fashion, and in practical politics, it means diverting the cause of revolution into the hands of the bourgeoisie, which will inevitably recoil from the task of consistently carrying out the revolution. So what is he saying there? He's saying that we can't count on the capitalists to fight for people's democratic rights, that they will inevitably surrender in that process. And so in order to fight for democracy and democratic rights, it is essential to put forward the whole revolutionary program. That is a necessity. Um, it is necessary to put forward the whole revolutionary program because the bourgeoisie will recoil. The bourgeoisie, the capitalists will recoil. The difficulties that lie on the road to complete victory of revolution are great. No one will be able to blame the representatives of the proletariat if, having done everything in their power, their efforts are defeated by the resistance of the reaction, the treachery of the bourgeoisie and the ignorance of the masses. But everybody and the class-conscious proletariat above all will condemn social democracy if it curtails the revolutionary energy of the democratic revolution and dampens the revolutionary ardor because it is afraid to win because it is actuated by the consideration lest the bourgeoisie recoil. Meaning, you know, if they do their best, if the communists go out and fight for people's rights and they do their best and they mobilize and they do their hardest to fight for people's rights and they fail, no one's going to blame them for that. But if the communists are holding back the struggle, if they're holding back the movement because they want to maintain the support of some capitalist or other, then everyone is going to lose faith in them. People are going to see them as failures and as sellouts. Very important stuff. We'll get to the next section here. Another screen. Revolutions are locomotives of history, said Marx. Revolutions are festivals of the oppressed and the exploited. At no other time are the masses of people in a position to come forward so actively as creators of a new social order as at the time of revolution. At such times, the people are capable of performing miracles if judged by the narrow Philistine scale of gradual progress. But the leaders of the revolutionary parties must make their aims more comprehensive and bold at such a time so that their slogans should always be in advance of the revolutionary initiative of the masses and serve as a beacon, reveal to them our democratic and socialist ideal in all its magnitude and splendor and show them the shortest and most direct route to complete, absolute, and decisive victory. Tailing behind the masses, 
telling people what they already think and saying you agree. Tailism is not the answer. The communists must always be ahead, pulling forward the banner of our full program and our full slogan of victory. Because at times when the masses of people are in motion, they are capable of marching history forward at a rapid pace, performing miracles compared to the gradual progress that we're told is possible. Right? Leave to us the opportunists, bourgeoisie, the task of inventing roundabout, circuitous paths to prompt, prompt compromise out of fear of revolution, out of direct path. If we are compelled by force to drag ourselves along such paths, we shall be able to fulfill our duty in petty everyday work also. But let ruthless struggle first decide the choice of the path. We shall be traitors to and betrayers of the revolution if we do not use this festive energy of the masses and their revolutionary ardor to wage a ruthless and self-sacrificing struggle for the direct and decisive path. When the people are in motion, we don't hold them back. When the people are in motion, we let their energy go further. Let the bourgeois opportunists contemplate the future reaction with craven fear. The workers will not be frightened either by the thought of that reaction, promises to be terrible, or the thought of the bourgeoisie proposing to recoil. Very good. And the next section, just a couple more here. This is important stuff. This is very important stuff. The workers will not be frightened either by the thought that the reaction promises to be terrible or that the thought of the bourgeoisie proposes to recoil. The workers are not looking forward to striking bargains and are not asking for sops. They are striving to crush the reactionary forces without mercy and to set up the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. Of course, greater dangers threaten the ship of our party in stormy times than in periods of smooth sailing and liberal progress which means the painfully slow sweating of the working class by its exploiters. Of course, the tasks of the revolutionary democratic dictatorship are a thousand times more difficult and more complicated than the tasks of an extreme opposition or of the exclusive parliamentary struggle. This is very important. It's much easier to lose than to win. This is such an important point. It is so easy to lose, right? When things are not looking good when there's smooth sailing, there's just kind of liberal progress, things slightly get better every so often. It's much easier to be the extreme opposition. It's much easier to just condemn the society but assume you won't have any impact. But when, of course, you're in a period of actual uprising, an actual revolution, when you're not just the parliamentary opposition, the risks are a lot higher and it's a lot more dangerous. And that's what he's saying. It's easier to lose than to win. It's much easier to just assume that you're going to be on the margins, assume there'll be this gradual liberal progress. But when you're in a period where the masses are in motion, when you could actually win, it's a lot more dangerous. It's a lot riskier. He says, but who, whoever can deliberately prefer smooth sailing and the path of safe opposition in the present revolutionary situation, had better abandon social democratic work for a while and had better wait until the revolution is over, until the festive days have passed when humdrum everyday life starts again and his narrow routine standards no longer strike such abominably discordant note or constitute such an ugly distortion of the advanced class. At the head of the whole people and particularly of the peasantry for complete freedom, for a consistent democratic revolution, for a republic, at the head of all the toilers and the exploited for socialism. Such must, in practice, be the policy of the revolutionary proletariat. Such is the class slogan which must permeate and determine the solution of every tactical problem, every step of the workers' party during the revolution. So he's saying that this notion 
that we should tone it down in order to appeal appeal to the bourgeoisie and to appeal to the liberal elements. That notion must be opposed, that it's much easier to lose than it is to win, and that if you continue to try and appease the liberal elements, uh, you will be holding back the masses of people who are in a revolutionary mode. And I think that that applies very, very well to what we're living through in these times, because right now the masses are far more revolutionary than the left. The left supports the wars. The masses oppose the wars. The left, the left is trying to justify the actions of the Biden administration, its cancel culture, its harassment, its police repression. The working class opposes the rise of a police state. Uh, the the so-called left is telling people they should accept being poorer because it's good for climate change. It's good for the environment. Uh, and the working class is saying we're not going to eat bugs. We're not going to be poor. We're going to fight for a better living standard. The masses are far more revolutionary than the so-called left and their liberal capitalist bosses. That is what we need to understand. And we need to be with the masses of people, the people that are against the wars, the people that are against the dropping of living standards, the people that are against the police state. And we need to not be attaching ourselves to the liberal capitalists out of fear that they might abandon us, right? We have no loyalty to the liberal capitalists. It is our job to be with the masses of people. Um, and so I'm going to bring you, you know, this is a new thing we're doing on these streams, bringing you little passages from Lenin uh, or other revolutionary leaders where they make points that are relevant in these times, right? It is easier. Yes, the left is the left arm of imperialism. It is easier to lose. It is easier to be the permanent opposition and the smooth sailing than it is to actually win. But if that's your attitude, if you'd rather be the, the extreme opposition, if you'd rather be the permanent loser, uh, you don't belong in the revolutionary movement because we are in this to win. We are in this to win. We are in this to win. We are not in this to be the, the liberal talking head on CNN. We are not in this to be, you know, to secure our, our job as writers for Jacobin magazine. We are not in this to, uh, to, you know, get a seat on the trade union committee. We are in this to see socialism. We are in this to defeat imperialism. Um, and that is what he's saying. And that's the name of the essay, Dare We Win. Um, you know, that's also, we called our conference, you know, after Mao's slogan, Dare to Struggle, Dare to Win, we called our conference the uh, Dare to Win, a world beyond imperialism. That's what we called our conference because we are in a period where socialism could actually win in the United States. But if socialism remains attached to Joe Biden, if socialism remains attached to Kamala Harris, if socialism remains attached to cancel culture, to wars, if socialism remains attached to the, the degrowth agenda, if socialism remains attached to the police state, it will lose because the masses of the American people are in revolt against the police state. They are in revolt against their wars. They are in revolt against their degrowth. And it, a recipe for the defeat of socialism will be a continued attachment of the socialist movement to those policies that the masses are in rebellion against. January 6th, whether you agree with it or not, and we know the FBI was involved in making it happen, and we know Donald Trump is not great, the January 6th was a rebellion of working people against the wars, against degrowth, against a rising police state, against decline in our living standards. And if we are with the liberal bourgeoisie and their efforts to suppress and silence Americans that want to oppose these wars, we're going to lose. We must break with the synthetic left. We must break with the synthetic left completely. Break with them, all of them, Jacobin, PSL, all of them. We're with the masses of people. We are out of the movement to the masses. We are out of the movement to the masses. That is where we are. And we are with the people that are opposed to the wars. We are with the people that are opposed to the police state. And we will not hold back the masses of people or try to attach them to the liberal bourgeoisie. And that's what Lenin is talking about in that great passage that I just read you. So I'm taking a look. Oh, there's a rumble rant from Jamie Turner, um, right? Um, 
So, okay. All right. So now we'll do the roll call names and locations, names and locations. Uh, and I will call you out as I see you names and locations, names and locations. I will call you out as I see you. Um, and uh, after that, I'll play a song, play some music for you, and then I'll start answering people's questions. So if people have more questions for me to answer in the second half of the show, we've got a rumble rant. We've got a number of super chats here. Send them in. Uh, I'll put you on the list. Let's do it. Names and locations, names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Timoshenko is out in St. Louis. Rupert Fellows is in England. Memma is in beautiful California. Christopher is in Texas. Panos is in Greece. David Fox is in Bendigo, Australia. Joe is in South Korea. David is in Rennie. Uh, David Rennie is in Hamilton, Ontario. Rice is in Adelaide, Australia. Welcome, welcome, welcome. JT24 is in Mississippi. Jenny Lynn is in Cincinnati. Victory Jin is in New Mexico. Patch is in Arizona. Jamie is in St. Paul. Names and locations on the Rumble. Uh, is anyone on the Rumble? Anyone on the Rumble? Um, names and locations. We got Alex from Brazil. We got Karen Mendes, who's talking about two tactics, Germany. A great pamphlet. Go and read it. Patrick is in Maine. Shout out to you, Patrick. We got Alex from Brazil. Jamie in beautiful Boise, Idaho. Mexico, Saviero. The People's Republic of Cascadia, says Terry Strange. Shout out to Terry Strange. Great YouTube channel. Go subscribe to Terry's channel. She does great stuff. Names and locations, folks. Names and locations. I will call you out as I see you. Names and locations, names and locations. Names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Names and locations. Who is with us? Names and locations, names and locations. We got Ian from Yukon, Chris in Salt Lake City. Why shouldn't I vote for the PSL? All right. Um, all right. Um, Rally in solidarity with Palestine tomorrow in Fort Lauderdale. Very good. I'm supportive of that. Charles in Oaxaca, Mexico. We got Bob Troy in New York, Temple City, California. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Anyone else? Names and locations. You're on the list, Kinky. Names and locations. Jimmy Dore moderating the presidential debates. Great victory. And you're on the list, Gala. I will definitely talk about that. Nishish from India. Welcome, Nishish. Welcome. I'm probably butchering your name. I do apologize for that. Um, Nithish, Nith Nithish, Nithish. There you go. Names and locations, folks. Names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Oh, Bill Preston says hello. Very, very good. Good to have you here, Bill. Joe in New Jersey. Home of the Revolution. Go, Phils. Right? Lake Isabella. Tom McTeague. McTeague. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Anyone on the Rockfin? Uh, Boris, Illinois is on the Rockfin. Uh, Boris in Illinois. Um, very good. We are marching forward. We are marching forward to our Portland conference. We are marching forward to building the Center for Political Innovation. Nothing will hold us back. We will not surrender. So um, I see we got a couple more super chats. Uh, we've got a rumble rant to answer. But now I am going to put on a festive song. Uh, this is a, a an English uh, holiday song, kind of a revelry song from England. Um, it's very old. goes back to like the 1700s. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, it's around holiday time, winter time. People are celebrating the holidays and drinking. Um, it's one of those old, uh, old English festive songs. And I, uh, uh, you know, you hear it occasionally around the holiday time, but it's not considered a holiday. It's not considered Christmas music, I don't think. Uh, it's called... Wassail all over the town. Um, it's an old English carol that is very festive, and we should be getting ready to celebrate because we are celebrating. Here we go. Pray God send our pastor a good Christmas pie. 
and a good Christmas pie that may be of tea with a waltz and a bowl will bring to thee. we go yes i've always liked that um it's kind of a uh it, it's an old english uh i guess you could call it a christmas carol but there's nothing really christmasy about it it's just kind of about revelry about people um you know being together and celebrating the the revelry of the holiday season um so i guess now i will start answering people's uh questions the first question is a rumble rant that is on the rumble um the question is gleich schaltung was the Nazi party's process of infecting all cultural institutions with Nazism. Are we now experiencing a wokeness Gleichschaltung? Well, first of all, I'm going to Google Gleichschaltung. I'm sorry, I don't speak German very well. Gleichschaltung is coordination, was the process of Nazification through which Hitler and the Nazi party established a system of totalitarian control and coordination over all aspects of German society. Well, the thing is, under capitalism, generally the spheres of art and culture are dictated by those who own the means of communication. Uh, you know, those who own the TV networks, those who own the, the big music studios, those who own the, uh, the radio waves, the television networks. I mean, generally those who control the means of production control the art and culture. However, with Nazism, what you saw was power being consolidated into one section of the ruling class, Bonapartism, where one faction within the ruling class consolidated the power within its own hands. Uh, we saw big sections of the bourgeoisie being crushed by the Nazi state apparatus in order to implement the dramatic economic measures to try and stabilize the capitalist economy. And this is a process. This is capitalism in decay. And in my book, Where is America Going?, uh, I get into that in great length. Um, you know, I get into this process. 
Bonapartism, which is the capitalist system in crisis, different factions in the ruling class fight with each other, try to seize control of the state. And the Nazis, uh, as they represented uh, Hollamer Schacht, uh, they represented the Krupps and the Tysons. They represented one faction within the ruling class uh, that was trying to consolidate power and implement dramatic degrowth measures in order to stabilize the economy. Uh, they began to force their particular ideological message onto all cultural institutions. And you could argue that that is indeed happening in the United States right now, that there is an attempt to shut down and silence uh, right wing media, silence dissidents, silence other factions within the ruling class. You could argue that that is certainly the case, um, but that is always the case. Uh, you know, there's always divisions in the ruling class. There's always fights within the ruling class. Uh, however. Um, in a period like this, those fights become more intense because the rate of profit is dropping, living conditions and wages are going down. Um, that's what's going on here. And um, so, I mean, you could argue that it's a similar process, but Louis Bonaparte did the same thing. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the, there was a similar struggle. Abraham Lincoln shut down the opposition, uh, the slaveholders. Uh, you know, uh, Woodrow Wilson shut down his political opponents. He threw Eugene Debs in prison. Um, you know, so this is a process that happens when a capitalist crisis uh, is maturing and ripening, um, is that the capitalist class consolidates power in its hands and tries to centralize authority in order to impose measures for the good of the overall capitalist system. Um, and that's, you know, Louis Bonaparte attempting to stand above classes um, that's what Marx was referring to. And that's what we see when liberal societies deteriorate in, and collapse into illiberalism, which is the fascist process. Ultimately, the only solution uh, to the crisis of capitalism is for the banks and the factories and the industries and the centers of economic power to be controlled by the people. The people must control the means of production. We must have a rationally organized economy so that the artificial restraints on human growth are no longer imposed and that human growth can expand to greater, greater heights than ever before. And um, there you go. There you go. Um, so, yeah, uh, I hope that that answers your question. Um, but I would encourage you to, um, if you're curious about, about what I view as fascism, which is wokeism, uh, I would encourage you to read my book, Where Is America Going? Uh, there's an audio book of it on YouTube. Uh, Tyler McConnell, member of the Center for Political Innovation, a great high school English teacher, has recorded the entire text of this book as an audio book. Um, and uh, so you can listen to it. If you don't feel like reading it, you can listen to it as an audio book. Um, so, yeah, I will link Tyler McConnell's great audio book. And, you know, look, I, I know a lot of people from my generation, myself included, um, especially if it's fiction. I tend to read nonfiction, but uh, audiobooks of fiction books are much, much better for me. Uh, you know, some people just audiobooks are are the way to go. Um, so I will link Tyler McConnell's audiobook of my book, Where Is America Going? Um, I'm going to link it um, so that people, you know, if that's the way that you best consume uh, writing, I want you to read. I wrote the book so people could read it. Didn't write it to make money off of it. I mean, it helps pay for the cost of publishing it, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, but I didn't write the book to make money off of it. Um, I wrote the book so that people would read it. Um, and Kim Iverson liked it. She had me on her show to talk about it. And it's gotten some fantastic reviews. Keith Preston wrote an amazing review of my book, Where Is America Going? Keith Preston of attackthesystem.com. Uh, he loved, he absolutely loved uh, my book, Where Is America Going? He thought it was one of the most thorough analyses of capitalism and crisis that he'd ever read. So this is the audio book of Where Is America Going, uh, my, my book, uh, thanks to Tyler McConnell. Um, and I will link uh, the review of it. Um, attack the system. I will link, uh, you know, Keith Preston's great review of Where Is America Going? Um, you know, because, um, you know, um, it's... Uh, I, I appreciate it. It was a very, very thorough review that Keith Preston uh, wrote. Uh, very, very, very thorough. Um, so, um, you know, I I like that review and I would like uh, people to read it. So let me just um, 
let me just pull up the review of where is America going from Keith Preston, if I can find it. Uh, he, he does a lot. Keith Preston monitors a lot of different sections of the political landscape, and he has taken a liking to the analysis that we do on these streams. I'm sure he doesn't agree. He's more of an anarchist. Uh, he's an anarchist with like libertarian and uh, some conservative proclivities. Uh, he's an anti-statist, I would call him. Um, but uh, he really particularly finds the analysis that we do on these streams to be very, very meaningful. Um, and he wrote an amazing full-length review of my book, Where Is America Going?, showing showing he really got to the essence of what I was saying. And there was, you know, I mean, there was some disagreement, which is fine, right? You're allowed to disagree with me. There's not a law against disagreeing with me, um, you know, but he did a very, very good job. So I want to link that review uh, to people because it, it's good when you write a book to see that people appreciate it. You know, there's there's three great reviews up. Uh, one just went up today, finally. Uh, they, the Amazon had held it off for a while, from what I understand. But three great reviews of my book, Letter to Bob Avakian. Uh, have been published, um, you know, um, uh, on Amazon so far. But this this review is on attackthesystem.org. I can just pull it up. Um, I might have to do a search here. Do, do, do. All righty. Here we go. Divisions within the ruling class and their implications. This is a great review of the book where I talk about this process Um I talk about this process. So yeah, great review from Keith Preston of attackthesystem.com, right? The, the amount of depth of analysis that I do in this book, explaining the roots of the crisis, this is the result of, of these streams and us wrangling together as a community for years. This is years of our work together. This is a collective product of years of our intellectual work together as a community, wrangling with these big questions. So there we go. Um, so that was the rumble rant was about the like Schaltung. Uh, Karen Mendes, who's in Germany, is probably like covering her ears every time I say it because I'm doing the German wrong. But that's OK. All right. Why do people on the third world have this economic inferiority complex compared to the first world? They care too much how the rest of the world sees their country. Well, yeah, I mean, we in the United States, we're used to having our country be considered the best, you know, the best food, the best movies and all of that. And people in countries that are, uh, you know, not at the center of the world economy currently, that are still developing, often get very defensive. They feel like their country is underrepresented. They feel like their country is judged unfairly with stereotypes, um, you know, um, and that's that's not good. Right. And that we need to learn to respect all countries. Right. There's a, a level of decency that is missing. Uh, from discourse, you know, uh, where Donald Trump, you know, supposedly talked about shithole countries and all of that, you know, you, you know, you need to show respect for all countries. And that, yes, you know, you know, people who come from countries in the developing world often um, feel that their country is underappreciated, feel that their country's history is not known. Um, you know, and we Americans uh, are notoriously arrogant. Uh, when I was in high school, there was a German exchange student. She was from Germany. One day she was crying. I'll never forget this. She was crying. She was from a first world country, too. She was from Germany, um, you know, which is a first world country. Um, but even she felt some of that American chauvinism. And she was crying one day. I asked her why she was crying. And she said she was crying because someone had asked her if Russia was the capital of Germany. Someone at my high school had asked her if Russia was the capital of Germany. And she was just deeply hurt that someone would know so little about her home country, they would ask such a stupid question. Um, and it, it caused her to be quite emotional. It just, it just, you know, she just couldn't deal with how, how, um, I guess, uh, geographically illiterate, uh, we Americans can be. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's an arrogance, right? You know, there's that whole thing that people say about America shouldn't be able to bomb a country until all the citizens can find it on a map. Um, so there we go. How would gambling look in socialism? Would it be outlawed? I wouldn't have any problems with it if that's the case. Well, look, questions like this, right, I have to point out, are a little bit, you get these questions a lot. I was, I, people used to ask me questions like this all the time. Would there be amusement parks in socialism? Would, uh, you know, in a socialist society, uh, you know, what kind of deli? I mean, this is like, you know, a Seinfeld episode, right? Whether or not gambling is legal, has nothing to do with whether or not a society is socialist, okay? 
That's just a fact. You could have a socialist society where gambling was completely illegal. And you could have a socialist society with many casinos in it. Socialism is defined by how production is carried out. If production is carried out according to the market, according to profit, that's capitalism. If production is carried out according to an overall central plan set by a popular revolutionary government, that's socialism. And socialism comes in all different shapes and sizes. So you could have a socialist society where gambling is illegal. I think in most socialist societies, gambling is illegal. Um, but I, I don't know. Are there gamble, Is there gambling in China and Vietnam? It wouldn't surprise me if there is. I mean, I'm sure it's illegal in North Korea. I'm sure it's illegal. It's probably illegal in Cuba. It's probably illegal in, um, you know, and it was probably illegal in the former Soviet Union. But I can imagine that, you know, a socialist country that wanted to have tourism, a socialist country that uh, that wanted to, you know, have foreign investment might might do that. That doesn't define whether or not a country is socialist. Now, I personally have a low opinion of gambling. I do. I don't think that gambling is a good thing um, because, uh, you know, it's the whole thing about, you know, it, it kind of takes advantage of people uh, who are, you know, low income um, in that they really would like to win because they don't have money. Uh, number one. Uh, number two, um, if you win the lottery, that's money you didn't work for. Right. You, that's not money created by your labor. Right. So it's it's kind of like, you know, stock trading. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like um, usury, uh, you know, that that it's that if you were to win the lottery, that would be artificial wealth. I'm not going to take it away from you. But but my upbringing is that the way one comes about their wealth is by creating, is by advancing. Um and, uh, you know, gambling, uh, you know, it, it takes advantage of people who don't have it. Um, it creates an addiction. Um, it's a form of addiction, right? It often leads to an addiction where people will spend all their money, will, will destroy themselves uh, because they're, they're trying to get that thrill, right? Um, and it, it's psychologically bad for people and it, it can lead to an addiction. And I just, um, I, I have a very, very negative opinion of gambling, but that in and of itself, gambling does not, I mean, you know, there's nothing inherent in socialism that says there's no gambling. There's nothing inherent in, in, in socialism that says there is gambling, right? And that questions like that, you got to be careful with. And that, that you know, um, you want to be careful whenever people try to sit there and get you to design utopia, right? And that's a really common thing. And Destiny, when I debated Destiny, I don't know if you saw my debate with Destiny, Destiny Stephen Bennell, he tried to play that game with me. He tried to play the game of, well, tell me exactly how in your socialist society, um, you know, they want you to design an intricate, complicated blueprint so that he can tear it apart. Because any complicated blueprint you can dissect. And the nature of socialism versus capitalism has nothing to do with an intricate, complicated blueprint. The nature of socialism versus capitalism is simply a matter of who controls the means of production and for what purpose is production carried out? That's all that there is. And, and if someone's trying to corner you, right? And like, what is, what, you know, in an ideal communist world, well, our ideal, I should clarify, and this will probably come up in my conversation with Angela McCurdle that'll be at four o'clock Eastern time tomorrow. Um, and I'm waiting for the link. I mean, the links, uh, she's going to make the link or, or what? I'm, I'm waiting for it. But, but, our ideal society is one without a government. Our ideal society is one in which there is no state. Our ideal society is one in which there is no coercion of any kind, in which there is so much abundance that people can just do what they feel like doing and take what they need and take what they want from each according to his own ability to each according to his needs. We want to abolish all coercion and all scarcity. So if you ask us what our ideal society is, our ideal society would be one in which there'd be no point in gambling because everyone already has enough, right? Um, you know, so like there'd be no point, right? So you've got to avoid that. If someone asks you what your ideal society is, you have to say, we want a society of so much wealth and abundance that there's no coercion, no inequality, no state. Um, so then you're asking us the road to getting to that society. What, impl what, what, what might we measure? Well, we want socialism. We want the means of production, the centers of economic power 
to be working in the interests of society. We want to control the natural resources. We want to control the lending of money. We want to organize production and the economy in the interests of the people at large in order to make sure that growth is unlimited and that poverty is abolished. That's what we want. And might one do that in a way where gambling is legal? Sure. And one might do that in a way in which gambling is illegal, right? Um, and you have to be careful, right? And you never want to fall into that trap. You know, there's a Seinfeld episode uh, one of the classic Seinfeld episodes where, you know, it's like, uh, I think, uh, what's his name? Um, Kramer. Kramer and um, his friend are talking about communism. And he says, will there be delis under communism? And he says, well, sure, there'll be delis under communism, but you, you can't have separate classes for the meat. Uh, you got to have the meat all the same. Or say, it's just stupid, right? This is, this is the way we've been taught. We've been taught that communism is playing Sim City. That's what we've been taught. We've been taught that communism is playing Sim City. Communism is you sit there and you draw up and you draw, design the roads of your perfect world. That's not Marxism. Now is not the time to play Sim City. Now is not the time to play Sim City. Now is the time to play Oregon Trail. Don't play Sim City. Play Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail. Be at our conference in Portland. No more Sim City. It's time to play some Oregon Trail, right? And if anyone is a millennial like me and uh, you played educational video games or computer games uh, in your uh, elementary school years, you will get the joke. You will get the joke. Oregon Trail rather than Sim City. So there we go. There we go. Names. Oh, uh, anyway, I'm not doing names and locations. But anyway, I'm downloading a clip uh, that we'll show from the Destiny debate um you know <laughs> is that what happens out there in oregon terry people die from dysentery um so there we go there we go there we go but i'm downloading a, a clip from the destiny debate the destiny debate was epic i mean it really and it this channel in terms of subscribers and viewership shot up right afterwards destiny did not know what hit him i was supposed to be uh uh poster child for him explaining to his audience that tankies and hardline communists are the same as Nazis. And it didn't go so well for destiny. Stephen Bunnell. Um, if, uh, that debate has been viewed by well over a hundred thousand people. Um, I, I gave destiny a run for his money. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, if you want to watch the entire debate, I will link that, but we're downloading one particular clip. Um, you know, one particular clip from that debate that I just I thought might be worth viewing um, because, um, you know, that that debate was really that was that was a great victory for our channel. Uh, and, you know, that set us on the course to do many of the great things we've done since then, uh, getting CPI going. So we can watch the full debate. Uh, you can watch it here. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to put on the clip. Um, we're going to put on, we're going to put on the clip, uh, just a five minute clip from that debate just because, right. Just because, uh, we're on topic. If anyone has any more super chats, I do have a few more super chats to get through. Um, but since that reminded me of that and I need, I need something to put on here as we continue with our show. Um, yeah, the downloading is going very, very slowly, but uh, we'll put that on. Maybe we'll do another super chat while we wait for it. What are the biggest misconceptions? That, well, this is related. What are the biggest misconceptions people have about communism? Biggest one, equality. This is one of the biggest misconceptions. I was taught this. We were all taught this, that communism is about inequality, inequality of income, inequality of living standards. And the goal is to equalize income or equalize living standards. You will not find that in Marx anywhere. Anywhere. And in fact, if you read the critique of the Goethe program, Marx makes very clear we are not interested in redistributing income. We are interested in redistributing ownership of the means of production, property relations. And that our goal is to create a society where there's so much wealth that inequality fades away because there's enough for everybody. But at no point anywhere in any communist writing is the goal. The communists are going to take power and make everyone equal. And I've heard this. People, I don't know where people get this from. I was lied to. You were lied to. I've told my whole life I've heard 
Communists are people, they want to rise up and overthrow the rich people and divide up their wealth. False. False. That is, that is not true. That we want to overthrow the rich people and divide up all their money, divide up their wealth. False. Completely false. Communism is about changing property relations. So production is carried out for the benefit of society, not for the profits of a wealthy few, where poverty and abundance do not walk hand in hand. Uh, communism is about a rationally planned economy overcoming scarcity. And this is extremely important. It's extremely important. And that that the, the right-wing critique of socialism, socialism doesn't work because eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> That's Margaret Thatcher. You run out of other people's money. That I, has nothing to do with what we believe. Right? Socialism is not taxation. Socialism is not the creation of a welfare state. Socialism is the reorganizing of production for the benefit of society. And if all the communists in the Soviet Union had done is redistribute other people's money, the Soviet Union would still be a deeply poor agrarian country. But instead, they built it into a superpower. If all the Chinese communists had done is redistribute other people's money, then China uh, would still be a deeply poor country. It is about reorganizing production so that growth is unlimited, so that poverty amid plenty is abolished, so that production is carried on in a rational basis for the good of all society. Uh, that is what communism and socialism are about. And that a lot of the left don't understand this. A lot of the burning crowd, they talk about income inequality, income inequality. I want to abolish billionaires. I don't want to abolish billionaires. I want everyone to be a billionaire. I want to abolish billionaires. No, wh why would you want to do that? Right. I mean, you know, if they'd abolished billionaires in the year 1700, uh, we'd all still be living in huts. We're all billionaires compared to people in 1700. Right. And that's good. Right. We want a, a, an existence for humanity that is astro astronomically higher than what billionaires enjoy in our time. We are not against wealth. We are not against growth. We are against exploitation. We are against the irrational, irrational nature of the capitalist system. So since folks reminded me of the destiny debate, and since we're still kind of on that topic of, you know, utopian models and why that's a trap not to fall into, I'm going to show this short clip, short clip from my debate with destiny, Stephen Bonell. Uh, so yeah, you can watch the whole debate. It was an epic win for our community, an epic win for our channel. And uh, now Oh, all right. For um, capitalism, but they do blame Venezuela, right? My understanding of Haiti is there are a lot of corruption problems that exist within that government. It's not literally just they tried capitalism and it's ruining the country, but then people <laughs> do blame Venezuela. Well, that was because Venezuela like very specifically started to make socialist pivots in its economy. It started to nationalize more industries. It started to, wait, which part of that do you disagree? Do you, do you, do you disagree that they were expropriating industries? Do you disagree that they the tried to hardcore set price control? The rate of state ownership in Venezuela is actually much lower than the rate of state ownership in China. Other than wait, wait, wait. Oil, How is that a response? No, no, no. You wouldn't compare the state oil. Of very little is nationalized. And I've been to Venezuela. And one of the biggest problems they have is that their economy is entirely centered around oil. And when the oil price dropped in 2014, that caused a huge amount of scarcity. They, they need to have, you know, farms there. They need to have steel manufacturing there. And they don't have it. If they had state run big steel mills and state run farms and all of that, they'd be in a much better shape. Um, OK. If we, if you want to, at a future de debate, I would love to come back and talk about Venezuela because I am positive that your assertions there, that it was just because oil collapsed, that that's why that country fell apart, is absolutely not true. And that no person well, that has been involved, is a big as well. no, not corruption, that it was very specifically, there. okay, it was very specifically pivots towards trying to socialize or nationalize or expropriate parts of their economy to set incredibly restrictive price controls that caused capital industry to flee that country, that caused some firms to no longer produce goods that or provide goods for its people. This is one of the large reasons why Venezuela. It's not just because oil prices fell a little bit. You don't see other OPEC so countries. Read, you, an oil producing you know, country, a huge oil producing country, bigger oil reserves than Saudi Arabia than I've heard. The oil prices drop, and at the same time, they suddenly start having big economic problems. But it's unrelated. It's all just because they believe in socialism too much. That's what you're saying. 
Um, like oil price drop of 2014 was dramatic. At that point, you could buy a, a family meal at Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, that would cost more than a barrel of oil. The petroleum sector accounts for roughly. Oil, sure. So I'm just looking this up. Sure. I, I'm literally just I'm looking this up on the fly because I know you're you're very incorrect. The petroleum sector accounts for roughly 87 percent of Saudi's budget reserves, 90 percent of the export's earnings, and 42 percent of GDP. That's petroleum in Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. Oil is Saudi more- Arabia had big economic problems as well. Saudi as Arabia didn't have pictures of families eating rats off the street because their economy tanked so hard. I don't because have people not to- from Saudi Arabia crying that they're in the country that are guest uh, workers, slaves. Uh, okay. Saudi Arabia, you couldn't take a picture like that. And Saudi Arabia uh, has had big economic problems during that time. Sure. Okay. So- um, Look, I'm, cu- I'm, I'm very curious. I just, I'm Nigeria just curious. Nigeria had problems. Oil producing countries all suffered as a result. Sure. Of they did suffer. I agree. Go ahead and let uh, Destiny go ahead and ask, get the your point. The fact that Venezuela didn't. Are you going to make the claim that Venezuela suffered just as much as every other OPEC country did when oil prices fell? Is that the claim that you want to make? No. So why does Venezuela did suffer also support? suffers from sanctions from the United States? Venezuela also has big problems with corruption, and they also have the problem that they don't have. You said that. That the problem was they they already had steel manufacturing. They already had big farms. No, the problem is they don't have it. It's a one commodity. Why economy. is that relevant? That is- Why does that matter? You don't need to produce every good that your society consumes. Uh, if if that's if your entire economy is centered around oil, right, and you are importing all of your food and products, and then you get sanctions imposed on you, and yes, there are big problems there, and they've manifested themselves, and. I think it's interesting, though. Now, you acknowledge. Now, what I think is interesting about your Venezuela narrative is the narrative I normally get from people about Venezuela is that everyone has been poor and starving ever since they had socialism there, and that proves communism always fails. That's not the narrative that you have. You've you've admitted that there were economic successes there until a certain point. Now, why does the media lie? Why Why can't they admit what you just said? Why, why I don't do you know. know. I'm not. I'm not here to talk there. as a Fox News correspondent. I'm just curious why you think central planning well, or is effective. MSNBC when the, or CNN. None of them I'm can not admit MSNBC there were big or CNN. with their socialist economy <laughs> until roughly about 2014. Why am I getting yeah, let, real? Let's 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 let's, let's not obscures extensively obscures. Why are you saying this and none of them are saying? This? I don't. I don't. I don't think Destiny wants to. I don't think Destiny wants to speak for media companies. I'm not here. Well, I, I appreciate your know? honesty because sure. everyone the country, tells me all the time everyone's been starving ever since they, they moved towards socialism in Venezuela. You admit that the problems began fairly recently. Thank sure. you. I'm, yeah. The, the, Thank the, you for your honesty. So we can agree anti-communists are liars. We can agree on that. That the anti-communist narrative that's promoted throughout U.S. society is based on deception and falsehood. Thank you for admitting that. I appreciate I, it. I don't know if Destiny can... can wait, wait, wait. Can so I haven't admitted that claim. anything. Why, and why sure. is it necessary to lie, Destiny? Why don't they say what you just said? Why don't why I don't I don't I, be, I don't I don't think Destiny that. can't Destiny can't that, speak for media companies. Well, Destiny, well, go I, ahead and I, I, respond. That because most of the people that were alive in the United States probably either have parents or grandparents that were involved in some crazy dumbass U.S. war against communists. <laughs> And the idea that like all commies are trying to destroy the world and commie blah 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 and like that that is a lie and it's stupid it's incredibly stupid the way that Americans view if you ask the average American what is socialism the answer they would probably give you is stealing money from the rich and giving it to the poor. So there you go. Right, uh, Destiny, he's a lying sack of shit. But in that debate, I wouldn't let him. I just wouldn't let him get away with it. And he tried everything to say that Venezuela's problems were all because they had socialism and. I maneuvered and I just wouldn't let him get away with any of that. Right. I talked about the the oil price drop. I talked about how Venezuela doesn't have a large production production sector run by the state. So, yeah, that was that was great. And, uh, you know, if you want to watch the the full debate, the actual full debate uh, that I did uh, with Destiny, um, you can watch it here. Uh, and that was a win for our community. Hundreds of thousands of people have watched it. Um, so, yeah, there you go. There's that. Uh, there's that just looking in the rumble and all right, looking in the rock fin. Uh, all right. If anyone has any more super chats or anything they want me to talk about, go ahead. Um, all right. Uh, which brings me to ask how to convince someone who has been exposed to anti-communist propaganda, that communism is actually good and it works pretty simple. What was China like before the communists came in? What is China like now? What was Russia like? Before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, what was Russia like now? What is Russia like now? What was Russia like in the 1990s when it had free market policies? What is Russia like now that the state controls the major energy companies? Um, What was Cuba like before Fidel? What is Cuba like now? 
What was Libya like under Gaddafi? And what is Libya like now? Uh, what was Libya like before Gaddafi? What was Libya like under Gaddafi? And what is it like now? I mean, it's it's obvious. They do everything they can to obscure the obvious. Communism has been a largely successful economic system. That doesn't mean human rights weren't violated. That doesn't mean there were serious shortcomings when it came to the production of consumer goods. That doesn't mean that there weren't, you know, crimes, atrocities committed, innocent people put in gulags or murdered. But the standard line, communism just doesn't work, is bullshit. It's complete and utter bullshit. Communists invented space travel. Communists turned the Soviet Union into an industrial superpower. Communists have built the world's largest telecommunications manufacturer in the world. Communists have built the world's largest hydroelectrical power plants. Communists invented the AK-47 rifle. Communists invented the mobile phone. Communists have done astronomical amazing things. Communists have lift, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. These are undisputed facts. And the desperation, well, there was this famine in like the early 60s in China. There were famines every day before the communists took power. Every year people died of malnutrition. There were all kinds of famines before the communists took power. Right. Oh, yeah. But, you know, but like Stalin, he killed people. Wow. I can't think of any capitalist government that's ever killed anybody. Oh, boy. You know, uh, oh, well, you didn't have human rights in the socialist countries. Geez, I can't think of any capitalist society that's violated human rights before. It's all bullshit. Anti-communism is a pack of bullshit. It's a pack of bullshit. It's all just bullshit. Oh, communist countries don't have human rights. Plenty of capitalist countries don't have human rights. Oh, communist countries, you know, there's famines. There were famines every day, and it's the communists who built the, the agriculture and mechanized agriculture and raised people out of poverty and got rid of that. So that doesn't work, right? Oh, well, well you know, the, the communists, uh, you know, they, they jailed and oppressed a bunch of people. Well, uh, I, the biggest rate of incarceration in the world today is the United States of America, right? Well, communists, you know, communist economics, I mean, they just stifle innovation. What's well, funny that they invented space travel and cellular phones and mobile phones and satellites and, you know, LED lights and all of that. It's funny they invented all that, you know, um, you know it's pretty wild. Uh, you know, I mean, anti-communism is just a pack of lies, right? Does that mean that there weren't a lot of bad things done in the Soviet Union, that people didn't suffer, that there wasn't bad things that happen? Of course not. Does that mean that people didn't suffer unfairly during the Mao years in China or even today in China? Of course not. But anti-communism is based on a pack of lies, right? Compare Nicaragua to Honduras, Guatemala, and the surrounding free market countries. Nicaragua, Christianity, socialism, and solidarity, the Sandinistas, people are doing pretty well. Cuba sends literacy volunteers and medical volunteers all over the world. According to Ban Ki-moon and all kinds of sources, they have the best medical school in the world, one of the best medical systems in the world. Uh, you know, th this is just, you know, it is a pack of lies. Anti-communism is a pack of complete and utter lies. When Libya was a socialist society under Gaddafi, people from all over Africa were trying to get into Libya to try and get some of the access to the wealth that socialist uh, oil production was creating, the socialist society there. Now that Libya has been bombed into the free market and bombed into capitalism and chaos, people are drowning in the Mediterranean trying to get out of Libya. So it's, it's just a pack of lies. Just a pack of lies. Anti-communism is a pack of utter lies. That's what it is. It is based on lies. Period. Right? People say communists are anti-Christian. Yes, horrendous things were done to Christians in the former Soviet Union uh, and, and in other communist countries, but that has changed. Fidel Castro accepted Christ, and he talked about how he was a Christian in the final years of his life. Uh, you know, Maduro, the leader of socialist Venezuela, is Roman Catholic. Hugo Chavez, who came before him, was also a Roman Catholic. Daniel Ortega, the leader of socialist Nicaragua is a Christian. And the slogan of the government is Christianity, socialism, and solidarity. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the leader of the Russian Communist Party, Zhenady Zhuganov, is a Christian. He's a Russian Orthodox Christian, right? So, you know, uh, you know, that's a pack of lies too. Anti-communism is just based on playing off people's ignorance. You know, oh, here's a picture of a starving person. That's communism. That's the whole experience of communism. And you know what infuriates me the most about anti-communism? What pisses me off the most about it is the arrogance. 
right? These anti-communists, they're just like, well, communists want to divide up everything equally, and that wouldn't work because then everyone would be lazy, right? And they think that, like, the millions of people who died fighting for communism in China, the millions of people who died fighting for communism and defending the Soviet Union and waving the hammer and sickle, the millions of people who gave their lives for communism, the millions of people who fought and gave their lives to the mission to create a socialist society to reach that ultimate goal of communism were just so stupid that we couldn't, we didn't understand that everyone getting paid the exact same wage doesn't work. It makes me angry. They have this simplistic understanding of communism. And it never occurs to them that the millions and millions of people who built China into a modern country and under the leadership of the Communist Party, studying Mao, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, all of them were just so stupid that they couldn't understand, you can't, everyone can't be equal, then everyone would be lazy, right? That all the people, all the people who fought for the Soviet Union, who rallied to the defense of the Soviet Union, all of them were just so stupid that they didn't realize, you know, and that's what's the most infuriating thing about anti-communists. They have no desire to know what communists actually believe. They have no desire to understand what communists stand for. They assume that we're all just like, you know, you know, three-year-olds going, it's no fair. Some people have more money than others. It's no fair. It's no fair. And then, well, you need to understand those people worked for their money, little Johnny. And they think that solves the argument, right? Anti-communist tropes are the most annoying thing, right? I had a teacher who said communism is if I gave every kid in the class a C, right? And I mean, it's like that's the level that anti-communism is. It's stupid. Right. It, it is idiotic. It is insulting. Right. And and it's arrogant It's the height of arrogance. Right. Millions and millions and millions of people have fought for communism, have died for communism, have mobilized for communism, have believed strongly in communism, have have built their countries up in the name of communism. But all of them were just so stupid they couldn't understand. Well, if you just give every kid in the class a C, no one will work hard and turn in their homework. I mean, it's like it infuriates me, right? How can I mean, you know, I'm not a fascist, but I have read fascist literature. I know why fascists believe what they believe. I am not a libertarian, but I have read libertarian literature. I know what libertarians believe. I am not a liberal, but I know what liberals believe. And these anti-communists, it's just it's based on fear and cowardice. That is what drives me up the wall about anti-communism. They don't want to know. They don't want to know what communists actually believe because of, they're afraid of the social consequences for knowing it. That's all it is, right? They have no idea what communists believe. They have no idea why they believe it. And they're scared to actually learn it because they're afraid they might get in trouble. They might get canceled. People might judge them. Communist is a bad, communism is a bad thing to be in America, so I better not know about it. I better just memorize a couple dumb cliches about every kid in the class getting a C or whatever, because if I investigate it and I actually learn it and I actually learn that there might be some truth in it, I might not fit in. I might get judged. I might get persecuted. Well, maybe you should take a $1 bill out of your fucking wallet. And look at the founders of this country. Do you think they got persecuted? Do you think they? Do you think they? They got persecuted. Do you think they risked anything? You know why not? Why don't you ask yourself about Martin Luther King Day? Who was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Do you think he took any risks for what he believed? Do you think? Do you think he he just went along with what everyone else said because he didn't want to know because he might get in trouble? History is not made by cowards. And intellectual cowardice infuriates me. And most anti-communism is nothing but intellectual cowardice. When I was a small, young teenager, I discovered that the Soviet Union had astronomical economic successes. And when I saw that, I got angry because I had been lied to. Because everything I'd been told about communism, well, it just doesn't work. It was a pack of lies. It was a pack of utter lies, utter lies, and it infuriates me. And those utter lies, they don't just cause people to not believe in communism. I was here in New York City in 2011, and there was a bill that was proposed. I wrote an article about it at the time. It's in my compilation of articles, Capitalism Must Be Destroyed. Mayor Bloomberg 
overturned. There was a bill requiring all cities, all you know, firms that do contracts with the cities to pay their employees ten dollars an hour. Pretty, pretty basic, right? That if you do business with the city, you got to pay a living wage. Mayor Bloomberg vetoed it, and you know why he vetoed it? Well, the Soviet Union they tried to you know make, give everyone a living wage, and communism failed, so uh, we can't do that. Yeah, yeah, we can't do that. You know, I'm the mayor of New York City, Mayor Bloomberg. We, you know, we can't pay people a decent wage. Communism, right? Bernie Sanders. Every debate Bernie Sanders did, every single one. He'd be up there and say, oh, I think we ought to provide health care. Oh, my God. Pol Pot killed millions, gajillions of people. You want to give people free health care? Oh, my God. It's anti-communism hurts all of us. Right. Anti-communism has led to a situation where our roads are falling apart, where we have private prisons, prisons for profit. We have schools for profit and charter schools where where our drinking water isn't being properly purified. Our country has been ripped apart to the drumbeat of anti-communism. Anti-communism is the reason that you are stuck in a cycle of low-wage, short-term service sector jobs. You don't have a good-paying industrial job with a union. Anti-communism is the reason that we are spending billions of dollars on this huge military we have to send all over the world because if not, the communists are going to come and take over. You know, uh, anti-communism is why they're sending billions of dollars to Ukraine. Well, that Putin, you know, he's a he's a KGB guy. He's trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. He's trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. Anti-communism hurts you. And it's bullshit. And it's based on a pack of complete lies. It is based on lies and it hurts you in your life. Every all kinds of awful things in your life are justified with anti-communism. You don't have health care because of anti-communism. Your wages are low because of anti-communism. People in your neighborhood don't have the the medical care they need and the jobs and opportunities they need because of anti-communism. Roads aren't being paved because of anti-communism. Drug gangs are coming into this country and drug gang violence uh, is taking place on the U.S. border. You know why? Because starting in the 1980s, the USA started sending weapons to people called the Contras who murdered people. And you know what the justification for sending them those weapons was? Anti-communism, right? Anti-communism. It's not just about being wrong about communism. It is a poison pill that has destroyed so many lives and has made so many people right here in this country miserable. We must stand up to anti-communism. So there you go. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. All righty. The left is the left arm of imperialism. And it has always been that, right? Social democracy was not, it, it deteriorated into a mechanism for stabilizing capitalism. The aristocracy of labor, Uh, The rise of the welfare state was not about moving gradually one step at a time towards socialism. And it's funny because the right wing will say that. Oh, my God, one step at a time. You know, first they have free health care. You know, then they have a government public school. Next thing you know, communism. It's never happened that way. In fact, it's the opposite. Right. Social democracy leads to solidifying the welfare state of the Western countries and stabilizing the West so it can dominate the world. Social democracy, as Lenin pointed out, is an essential aspect of Western capitalism deter- de- moving into the monopolistic stage of imperialism. You could not have had World War I if it wasn't for the rise of social democracy and the social democrat leaders who betrayed the workers and led them off to war. Social democracy is really, as Stalin said, it is social fascism. They preach socialism, but they practice fascism to preserve capitalism for the bosses That is what wokeism is. Wokeism is a new brand of social democratic fascism, right? It is about stabilizing capitalism. And we must remember that. And um, you're absolutely right, David Fox. And it has always been that, right? The, the, the labor fakers, uh, the, the social Democrats, the pro imperialist consolationists, HG Wells, the Fabian society, those people have always, always, been about stabilizing and making a more effective imperialist society. They always have been. And that's why we don't owe those people anything. We do not owe those people anything, especially now when they're more anti-communist and more pro-war and more pro-imperialist than the conservatives are. Maybe during the Cold War, we owed them 
something because they protected us from Joe McCarthy. Maybe we owed them something because they wanted to negotiate in Vietnam rather than escalate. Maybe we owed them something because they wanted to sign the SALT Treaty and de-escalate the arms race with the USSR. In the Cold War, maybe we owed them something. I don't know. I wasn't alive during that time, mostly. Uh, maybe during the Cold War, we owed the liberals something. We owe them nothing in these times. Nothing. In our current time, we owe Joe Biden. We owe Kamala Harris. We owe Bernie Sanders and AOC nothing. Nothing. What have they done for us? What have they done for us? Where have they ever sacrificed for us? Where have they ever taken a risk for us? Where have they ever stood up and fought for us? We owe them nothing. We owe the social Democrats, the social fascists, nothing. We owe them nothing. They want imperialism with a multicultural, environmental, friendly, pro-LGBT face. That is all they want. And we owe them nothing. Nothing. Is this your Saturday night entertainment? I hope so. Which brings me to Kinky's question. Kinky asks, why shouldn't I vote for PSL rather than RFK or Cornell? To tell you the truth, Kinky, I would rather you vote for RFK or Cornell rather than PSL. I'll just be honest with you. All right. Now, RFK, his position on Israel right now, it's pretty hard. I mean, it's it's horrendous. So, you know, I'm not going to make a strong case for RFK tonight. And Cornell West, I mean, by resigning from the Green Party, his campaign seems to not really be going anywhere. Um, but that said, I will tell you why I don't want you to vote for PSL. Let's pull up the PSL platform. And I've done this on previous streams. I was thinking about cutting this, but I just, you know, I don't want to be Mr. Negative, right? I don't. I don't want to be Mr. Negative here. I don't, right? Um, but you'll notice that Anya Parampil and and Max Blumenthal, as they go after Ben Norton, they are also um, they are also going after the PSL. Um, and I'm going to pull up the ten point plan of their presidential campaign, um, and we'll just go over it very quickly. And I, you will know, you will know their website. Here it is: votesocialist2024.com. I'll tell you why not to vote for them. Because their program, right, um, their program is very much a pro-Biden fascist program, right? It is a pro-Biden fascist program. That's what it is. One of their planks. This is one of their planks, right? Um, and it, it's very interesting because it's a deceptive program. They have their, like, 10 points of what they stand for. Um, and what's interesting about it is you'll notice that there are two kinds of demands in the PSL program. There's demands that could actually, actually be achieved. And then there's uh, a, an armed communist violent revolutionary fantasy. And the demands in the PSL program that are part of their armed communist violent revolutionary fantasy have no meaning because they're not going to do that. Right. PSL is not stupid. They're not waging armed struggle against the American government. They're not going to overthrow American capitalism and establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. So it doesn't really matter. However, the demands that they that could be implemented under capitalism, many of which are being proposed by the Democratic Party, are very dangerous. Here's one. Right. Bribery in America is legal and recognized industry called corporate lobbying. This practice must be outlawed and all politicians should be subject to a ban on serving on the board of any corporate board or holding an executive position in any type of company. Right? Now, what is that a call for? That's a call for lawfare. Right? You'll notice they arrested Donald Trump in New York for falsifying business records. Um, that they, they, There's a book called Three Felonies a Day about how they can use federal law around finance and campaigns to jail anybody. Right now, the Biden administration is trying to silence critics with what's called lawfare, right? where they, just, they accuse you of some corruption charge, they throw you in jail. 
And they use this all over the world. They used this to railroad Lula da Silva into prison. They used this to throw, um, to throw, uh, uh, you know, go after Christina Kirshner. And th- this is a real demand. The Biden administration wants sweeping anti-corruption laws that they can use to target any dissident. And right now they're using it against uh, the against the Trump people. And who else are they using it again? One of the bans they want to ban on lobbying, right? Bribery in America is a legal recognized industry called lobbying. And this practice must be outlaws. What is the Yahuru movement charged with? The African People's Socialist Party, the Yahuru movement, what are they charged with? They're charged with being unregistered lobbyists. So they want to stricten, to tighten the lobbying laws that are already being used to target black revolutionary activists. No, I don't agree. What else is in the PSL program? I'm just looking on their website. What else, right? Just, I did a whole stream about this, right? Um, what else? Oh, this is a great one, right? Now, we in the Center for Political Innovation, we oppose the low-wage police state. We're standing up for civil liberties, but we're linking the attack on civil liberties with the driving down of wages. That's the slogan we raise. Oppose the low-wage police state, down with the low-wage police state. Does the PSL program say oppose the police state, protect civil liberties? No. In fact, there's nothing, right? All of their slogans, there's not a single one about that. There's not a single one about protecting civil liberties. There's lock up the corrupt elite, more calls for lawfare. Uh, there's, you know, overthrow the rich. Uh, there's, uh, there's cut the military budget. There's nothing about protecting civil liberties. But what is there? End the war on black America. Not the war against the rights of working people, not even the war against non-white people. The war on black America. They want to separate the struggle of black people from, against police brutality from every other ethnic group and the war on black America. Now, that is toxic. That's absolutely toxic. Right? And you fit this in with what's going on right now. How all over this country... Low-income white people say our rights are being taken away. Latino folks say our rights are being taken away. Asian Americans say our rights are being taken away. Arab Americans who've been targeted by vicious, you know, police sting operations, their rights are being taken away. So the Black Lives Matter, the black community's heroic rebellion against police brutality, that should be something that should invigorate the whole working class to fight against the police state. No. PSL says the black community and the war on black people, but the rest of us, we can lose our rights. And it gets worse because the Party of Socialism and Liberation has viciously targeted a man that I really look up to, Douglas Kim, a Korean American, an actor, a poker champion. They have viciously gone after him. Why? Because he's a Korean American who has dared to point out that hatred and anti-Asian violence is widespread among African-Americans. And they are so woke that they say you have to just be okay with black people committing hate crimes against Asian-Americans, right? They basically have pushed anyone who wants to defend the Asian-American community into the Republican Party, right? They are playing racial favorites because black people tend to be Democrats And I don't even know if it's statistically true, but the stereotype is that Asian Americans tend to be Republicans, which I'm not sure that's even true. Because of that, PSL supports defending black people, but not Asians, but not Arabs, but not Latinos, but, but not other ethnicities. They have decided not to stand up to the police state. And actually their platform calls for more repressive white-collar crime laws, more repressive anti-corruption, anti-lobbying laws. So they want more of a repressive police state, and instead of saying to oppose the police state, they say, black people, focus on black people, right? And then their members have waged a smear campaign, a vicious smear campaign against Asian Americans who have dared to say, my people 
deserve to not be afraid that they're going to get beaten up or murdered on the subway. Look at the videos of the horrendous things that have been done to Asian Americans in New York City. PSL says that's okay. PSL is fine with that, and they're so fine with it that they viciously targeted an Asian American communist, a pro-North Korea, pro-Vietnamese Asian American communist because he spoke up about the crimes being committed against his people. So right there, that tells you why the PSL program is not good. But I am not finished there. One of their planks, save the planet from capitalism. I'm quoting to you, reading right from their website. Fossil fuel corporations should immediately be taken over by the public and repurposed to generate renewable energy. Now, listen to the language there. Fossil fuel corporations should immediately, not once we've developed fusion energy or better energy sources, not once uh, once we have developed better sources of energy, immediately all fossil fuel corporations should be taken over by the public and repurposed to generate renewable energy. So everybody in America, every part of this country that uses fossil fuels, all of them are immediately, everyone whose home is heated because of oil or natural gas, cut it off and replace it with renewable energy, which means windmills and solar panels. What would be the result of that? How much energy does a windmill put out? How much energy does a solar panel put out versus how much heat and electricity you get from natural gas and oil? It's genocide. They're calling for genocide. That would be genocide. You know, you think your, your, your heat and gas bill is high now. You know, this would lead to millions and millions of Americans being cold in the winter. It would lead to millions and millions of Americans not being able to travel. They're calling for shutting down the U.S. economy in the name of environmentalism. Yes, fossil fuels are bad. Yes, we need to move toward renewable energy. Yes, we need fusion energy, nuclear power to get rid of fossil fuels climate change, et cetera. But that's not what they're saying. They're not saying eventually we do that. They say in their program, fuel corporations should immediately be taken over by the public and transferred to renewable energy. That's genocide. That is genocide. That's big sections of this country without electricity. That's what that is. That's a nightmare. That's an utter, utter nightmare. And it must be opposed. It absolutely must be opposed. It is degrowth, right? Do you think that's what Stalin did? Did Stalin come to power in Russia and say, all right, you know, every part of Russia that's already got electricity, uh, you know? No, Stalin built an oil industry. Stalin built electrical power plants. Stalin organized and built that country up. Do you think the Chinese communists, when they took power, they said, all right, any section of China that's already got electricity, we're going to cut it back. No, communism is not degrowth. Right. And there's ways to be environmentally conscious. There's ways to be more rational and stranding. But they're calling. And again, this is something that could actually be implemented again. Right. Their Maoist fantasy about, oh, when we come to power, everything will be fair and we'll have the red guards. And yeah, blah, blah, blah. that's not going to happen. There's things in the PSL platform that are also in the Biden platform. Let me reemphasize that. There are things in the PSL platform that are also in the Biden platform. PSL is a counter gang for Joe Biden, right? Joe Biden, he wants average Americans to vote for him, but then he wants to have a group of a group of fanatical window breaking Black Lives Matter, you know, woke activists who are his foot soldiers to push through his agenda. And that's what PSL is. Biden Biden is the fascist and PSL are the brown shirts. And that's what they are. PSL is not a socialist organization. PSL are the radical foot soldiers of Joe Biden. That, you know, PSL, there's a reason that for the last two years, PSL has talked, has protested and organized about no other issue than abortion. Why? Because that's a Democrat issue. They are Biden's counter gang. They are Biden's foot soldiers. And Biden's agenda, the actual agenda, is degrowth. The actual agenda is lawfare and jailing dissidents on charges of, uh, of, of lobbying illegally or tax fraud or whatever. The actual agenda 
uh, is is uh, marginalizing and, and separating people from each other and making sure there's not a unified struggle against the police straight, inciting the black community against the Asian community. That is the Biden agenda. And PSL marches completely in lockstep with the Biden agenda. So voting for PSL is voting for Biden. Voting for RFK, you know, is voting for a guy who's not good on Israel, is not good on a number of things, but has said he's he's made the hill he wants to die on, opposing the vaccine mandates and opposing the lockdowns that devastated working people's lives and also uh, opposing opposing escalation with Russia. So if you vote for RFK, you know, again, you're also voting for a really pro-Israel guy. So that's a problem. And there's other problems there. So I'm not saying vote for RFK, but voting for RFK, the essence of voting for RFK, RFK is in the race to make a statement about being anti-war, to make a statement about vaccine mandates and opposing internet censorship and defending the vaccine critical movement. That's what RFK is doing. PSL is in the race to recruit people to join the Joe Biden counter gang. That's PSL is on a recruiting drive. Their election campaign is a recruiting drive. They want an army of 19 and 20 year olds uh, to go around and beat people up and threaten people and be the foot soldiers of Joe Biden. They are building a street counter gang to defend wokeism from dissent. And you can't have that. And and so. You know, I, 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 you know, Cornell West, what is Cornell West doing? Well, Cornell West, we saw there's disagreements there with Jimmy Dore, um, you know, uh, and all of that. But Cornell West, I mean, he's a known anti-racist activist, but his writing, he does frame the black struggle in the context of economic rights. He does talk about civil liberties. He has defended Uhuru. I mean, PSL has made statements for Uhuru also, but voting for Cornell West, voting for Cornell West or RFK, in my view, would be a thousand times better than voting for PSL. Voting for PSL is just aiding them in a recruit recruiting drive to build their woke fascist uh, foot soldier street army, um, you know, and whereas voting for RFK or voting for Cornell West or voting for, um, you know, there's various people you could vote for Tulsi Gap. Well, I guess she's not running, but, you know, Marion Williamson. I mean, there's various other people one could vote for, um, you know, uh, that that it would make you know, it would make some kind of difference or it would be making a statement other than trying to recruit for the PSL. Um, you know, and honestly, this isn't the best use of my time. But, you know, what is to be done? Lumpia has the answer. Lower and deeper to the real masses. I'll tell you what is to be done. I'll tell you something that'll make a million times more difference than voting for anybody. Play some Oregon Trail. This is what we need to do. Go lower and deeper to the real masses. We need to build a network and community of anti-imperialists. That is what is to be done. That is what is to be done. Vote with your feet and get yourself to Oregon. And let's have an auditorium full of anti-imperialists. Let's have a community of anti-imperialists coming together, dedicated to the struggle, working together, trusting each other, Building a network of anti-imperialists. That is what we need. That's worth more than voting for any candidate. Right? That is what we need. Right? If you want to make a difference in American politics, build the network of anti-imperialists that will withstand the coming storm. Help us develop mechanisms for recruiting so that we're not a social media-based organization anymore. So we're recruiting real people in real neighborhoods. People are joining us because we're providing services. We're feeding people. We're caring for people. Let us become the kind of organization that sinks our roots into the masses of people and builds an anti-imperialist network here in the heart of the empire. That, that is what is to be done. And that's worth more than voting for any candidate. We must go lower and deeper to the real masses. That is the answer. There is no shortcut. There is no get rich quick scheme. There is no other solution. We must go to the masses. We must go to the masses. Um, there's no alternative. So there you go. That is my answer, Kinky. I hope I wasn't too heated there. I'm angry about a text somebody sent me earlier, and I need to not be angry about that either. You know, relationships come and go in politics. Um, and, you know, I, I, yeah, that's all I can say about that. All right, next question. Next question. Jimmy Dore is moderating the independent presidential debate, and that's going to be awesome. That is going to be absolutely awesome because Jimmy Dore is great politically. Um, 
And, you know, I was on a Twitter space uh, with Lori Spencer uh, and uh, Christina, I can't remember her last name, who is the head of the Independent Presidential Debates Commission. She was on that very same panel uh, with Christina uh, and Lori Spencer and myself. Uh, it was really an honor to be on there. And then she followed me afterwards. We connected. Um, Christina is really, really great. Um, so, you know, um, she seems to be interested in the anti-imperialist circles that we're developing. Um, so there you go. There you go. All righty. Very, very good. Um, um, all right. So we did that one. Thank you, Gala. All right. How did Caleb Maupin become a reporter? Well, it's a long story. It's a very long story. And I, I would like to emphasize to people, and I'm not going to give you like all the details here, but there seem to be all these people I know that like they'll become my friend and they're convinced that I will like through being my friend, I will like give them a job as a reporter in anti-imperialist media and that they'll be able to be my friend for like three weeks or a year or something. And then I will go, oh, and I will give them an, an amazing media career. It doesn't work that way. Um, sure thing, Kinky. Love your work. Um, but, um, and you know, you're great kinky. And if you ever want to text me or anything, we can talk anytime. Um, but, um, how did I become a reporter? Well, uh, I moved to New York city during Occupy Wall Street. Uh, I worked for Ramsey Clark, uh, the former U S attorney general who ran the U S, uh, the international action center. And I was, uh, the spokesperson, the media spokesperson for the international action center. And so I represented the International Action Center on Turkish television, on Iranian television, on Nigerian and African television, and on RT. Uh, I was the spokesperson for the International Action Center. Um, and I did that, um, and I didn't get paid a cent. There was no payment involved, I mean, for, from, for the media appearances. I mean, I, I got compensated for my work with the IAC, got paid by a foundation, et cetera, but... Um, but I was not getting paid to do the interviews, right? I, I mean, none of the TV networks are paying me. And I did interviews for, for Turkish TV, for Arab, uh, Saudi TV, for, for international television. I would represent Ramsey Clark. I would represent the International Action Center. I worked closely with Sarah Flounders. I was kind of like Sarah Flounders' personal assistant, basically. I ran her Facebook for her for a while, and I, I ghost wrote her articles. And I was like Sarah Flounders' personal assistant for a long time. Um, then um, in 2013, I got a haircut. I used to have long hair and a beard. I got a haircut. Um, after I got a haircut, um, you know, I was approached, um, you know, because I was doing so many TV interviews with so many different networks. Uh, the folks at Press TV were wondering if I wanted to start working for them on a freelance basis. So I started filing reports with Press TV on a freelance basis. Um, and I, you know, I would bill them at the end of every month. And I worked at the UN desk for press TV. I did that for two years. Um, and then there was an opening at RT and I applied for it and I got hired at RT and that was in 2016. So yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, there's not much more to it than that. Um, you know, uh, first I was, a, a press, um, what do you call that? I was a, a media representative for Ramsey Clark and I did that for years. And then I became a reporter for one network, and then I became a reporter where I am now. So, you know, and it wasn't easy. Um, it wasn't easy. And, you know, working freelance is not easy. You know, there'd be months where I wouldn't get paid. You know, I would need to pay my rent. And, you know, people would say, oh, we'll get you next time, next month. And I'd just be like, oh, I got to pay my rent. You know, um, so it, it wasn't easy. My wife can tell you how stressful. Uh, it is. And how many hurdles I've had to jump through to get where I am. And, you know, honestly, in the last couple of years, it's been a bit stressful, too. You've seen that my character has been widely assassinated. Right. The Internet is full of very nasty, awful things to say, you know, say about me, um, you know. And also, there tend to be people who come into my life who are convinced that by like being my friend for a month, I can just like make them a famous Internet media personality. And if I don't do that, it's because I'm being a jerk. Uh, you know, and I, I, that's not how these things work. You know what I mean? Um, I will say this, right. And I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there because it just keeps coming up. One of the biggest criticisms of me, people can't stand how focused I am. They're like, Oh, Caleb is just thinking about communism and all this stuff. 24 hours a day. Yep. Yes, I am. 
Yes, I am. And then the same people are like, oh, it's so unfair that he's got a YouTube channel and he's got these published books and is a reporter for international television. How do you think I got that? Do you think I got that by not focusing on this 24 hours a day, not being obsessed? I mean, you know, and it's like these people, they want what I have, which is not much. I mean, I live in an apartment in New York City. Uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, you know, right now I'm actually financially, I'm, you know, not doing too well, honestly. I mean, I'm, I'm having to deal with the fact my income has very significantly decreased because of the social media hostility and, and such. But we're figuring things out, you know, but I'm not living in luxury. You know, uh, people have it that I've got this amazing life. It's like, no, I mean, I've got a job that pays my bills that I love and I believe in what I do. And I, I am proud to work at RT and I love RT. I love the work that they do. I love that they expose the truth and in a world of lies that they counter and, you know, imperialist propaganda. Um, I do. I will say when I'm at RT, I'm not, I put my politics aside. I'm not at RT to preach my message. You have to be objective in your reporting, right? If I was on RT preaching communism in my news stories, I would get fired, right? You have to be objective, right? And if you're going to work in the press, you have to work hard to be objective, Right. And I do that at my job. I work very, very hard. You know, what I do on these streams is very different than what I do at RT. On here, I'm just telling you like it is. But when I'm at RT, I have to act as a professional journalist. Right. Because that's what I am. So that's important to point out. Um, but people are always like, oh, you know, we want what Caleb has, but it's so annoying that Caleb is so obsessed. Well, I. I got what I have, what little I have, which is not much, right? I got my name run through the mud, all kinds of, you know, slime. First I was a neo-Nazi, now I'm an evil sex cult leader or whatever. I got my name run through the mud, I've got a decent income, you know, but I don't have much, right? But I got what little I have by being obsessed. So if you don't like the fact that I'm obsessed, then forget about having what I have because I got it by being obsessed. And the people who hate me, it's like they hate me for being obsessed, and they hate me because they're jealous of what I have. Well, they don't seem to understand that those two things are a package. You want what I have, be obsessed. Um, there's there's many anecdotes about this, right? Um, but, um, you know, it, it's interesting. People say that, um, you know, you should focus on realistic job opportunities, right? Instead of trying to live your dream, you should focus on realistic job opportunities. And I agree with that. Um, you know, I mean, if you can be an accountant, be an accountant. If you can be a, uh, a math teacher, be a math teacher. However, some people are just nuts, right? And I am one of those people. I am one of these people that is so focused. Look at this bookshelf behind me. Look at these streams where I'm talking for hours. I'm nuts in my own way. I'm not mentally ill and deranged. I'm just very, very obsessed and focused. And so for me, you know, working very, very hard at what I'm passionate about is something that's realistic. But for a lot of people who are just like, I want to be an actor. I want to be a songwriter. I want to be this, you know, someone says to me, I want to, I want to write, I want to write children's books. How many, have you written a draft yet? Have you written? Oh, then they don't really want to be a children's book. I want to be an actor. Have you taken any acting classes? No. Okay. You don't really want to be an actor. There's a lot of people who say, I want to do this. I want to do that, but they don't. Right. Someone said that, um, don't be an actor because you want to act. Be an actor because you have to act. Don't be a writer because you want to write. Be a writer because you have to write. You know, um, there are some people that are just so obsessed and so focused that they can, they can make this work. But it's not for everybody. You know, it's not for everybody. And honestly, you know, the stakes are pretty high. You know, I mean, if... <laughs> If a shooting war ever breaks out directly between the United States and Russia, I'm fucked. I'm fucked. They're coming for me and they're throwing me in a prison camp and you're never hearing from me again. Um, you know, I, I mean, that's just a fact, you know, um, and that's not because I'm a foreign agent. That's because I'll be on their list of dissidents. I sat down with Alexander Dugan. I work for RT. I'm fucked. You know, um, the stakes are quite high in doing this kind of work. Right. Um, you know, they are. Um, so, you know, um, people, a lot, you know, the grass is always greener. Let me just put it that way. You always think life is better for other people until you see what their life is really like. Some of the richest people in the world, I'll, I'll throw this out there. Some of the richest people in the world are not happy. 
And this is absolutely true. Some of the, you know, Bill Gates, Carlos Slim, Morgan, Rockefeller, some of those people are absolutely miserable because having all that wealth prevents them from having real meaningful relationships with other people. And while they, they don't suffer materially, they suffer psychologically from the fact that they're unable to really connect with other people because that's a one thing that gives people satisfaction. And that sounds like a hokey thing, right? A hokey thing to say, but it's actually true, right? That happiness is not generally measured by how much money you have. It makes a difference, right? You know, it makes a difference how much money you have to be comfortable, to not be worried about eating, to not be worried about paying your bills. It makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. So I'm not, I'm not saying that people can be struggling just to pay their bills or feed their kids and be happy. Obviously, it takes a toll on you. Um, however, if you want real satisfaction in life, you need to work and accomplish things. You need to take responsibility and accomplish things. And it's from those achievements that you will get satisfaction. And you need to have other people that you can have a genuine, real connection with. Right? That is what will bring you satisfaction in life. Um, and that there are many people that have a huge amount of wealth that have neither of those things. They haven't worked for any of the wealth that they have, so they don't, they don't understand it, right? They just inherited billions or whatever. And because they are so wealthy, everyone around them sees them as a potential, um, a potential bread, bread check. And that, you know, people who work in the homes of the rich will tell you uh, some of the rich people are the most unhappy, uh, most, um, backstabbing, paranoid, suspicious. You know, some of them are very, very, very unhealthy. Um, and that the money uh, is a barrier. You know, there was a there was somebody I, I worked with years ago and we stopped working together. Um, you know, and, and you guys, you'd have to dig pretty hard to find out who this person is. It was years ago, I was working with this guy and we're no longer working together. Um, and I realized this guy had a very wealthy father. And I realized that for him, having a wealthy father had hurt him because he had poor social skills. He had poor social skills and uh, he was constantly trying to um, trying to start a business or trying to start that. And he would fail. Uh, and he would fail because of his poor social skills, because he wasn't good at communicating with people. He wasn't good at taking into consideration other people's needs, etc. He would fail because of his poor social skills. But when he failed, he could just go and you know get bailed out by his dad. And so he never learned from his mistakes, right? You have to fail to succeed. You know, if you're learning to ride a bike, you got to fall over a bunch of times before you learn how to ride a bike. You have to fail in order to succeed. And if people are not able to fail, they don't learn to succeed. That's just a fact. Um, so if you want to go and succeed at something, fail. Go out and fail. I'm serious, right? If you want to get better at writing, go out and write badly and learn from how you wrote badly so you can write better. If you want to if you want to organize, do political organizing and you want to do it better, go out and fail. Go out and fail and then you'll learn from your mistakes and you'll do better. The best way to learn how to succeed is by failing first. And that is a fact. That is a fact. So, you know, you have to make mistakes. You have to learn from your mistakes. You have to fall down so you can get back, get back up again. And you have to have the relentlessness to do that. You have to have the drive. And that is one thing that I see missing in a lot of the younger people I work with is there's no drive. You know, they kind of want success. They kind of want to have more followers on Twitter or something. They, they want to have, they want to, you know, be involved in a revolutionary movement. But the second that things go wrong, they just go, oh, oh boy, I'm not going to do it. And they just give up. Well, then you're not going to succeed. And I see a lot of that. And I mean, maybe this will get me banned. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a doctor. But I'll just say this. I think a big factor in that is psych meds. I'm dead serious. I, I, I am just being honest that I, not a doctor, not a psychiatrist, I think psych meds make people give up. And that's, you know, maybe there's a psychiatrist or a psychologist or, or somebody who knows something about, um, about pharmacology or whatever who will say I'm wrong. But I am convinced that a lot of those psych meds they give to people to make them calm down, to make them less depressed or less angry or whatever, 
it takes away their grit. I'm serious. There is there are a lot of people I know, um, you know, from the younger generation, and they take these psych meds because they, you know, they're angry, they're frustrated with the world. How could you not be right? And throughout whatever, and they're on psych meds, and they take psych meds, and the psych meds take away their passion. And then you know, yeah, they vaguely want to be a communist, or yeah, they they want to do something. But then the second anything goes wrong, oh, 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 oh. I can't do anything, you know, you know, now I'm not a doctor and I have no like way of diagnosing that. And who knows, maybe for some of these people, they're better off. Maybe without them, they would kill themselves or something. So I am not here to give medical advice, but I'm just telling you, I don't trust big pharma. And I think that mental health is largely not chemical. I think it's largely social. I think people's mental health is largely a result of trauma that they experienced growing up. I think it's also a lack of meaningful interaction relationships. There's something wrong in how they relate to other people. Um, that's what I believe. And uh, I do think that a lot of the, the um, pharmaceutical approach to mental health hurts people because it just kind of numbs them and it doesn't enable them to solve the problem. I'm just being honest with you. It doesn't enable them to solve the problem. Um, you know, uh, that, that, you know, yeah. I mean, if somebody can't get along with people, if someone gets angry, if someone loses friendships and all that, there's, there's a problem there. Um, but if you give them a drug, you gave them a drug. Does that lead to them going out, having more relationships and learning from it? In a lot of cases, no. It just leads to them just kind of numbing over the, the pain, becoming less irritable, becoming less excitable. It doesn't solve the problem, right? And I see a lot of that. I see a lot of that. Um, so this is just my two cents, right? And maybe I should keep my mouth shut about things like this. Maybe people don't care what I think about these things, but I'm being honest with you all, right? I'm real. I'm very real on these streams, by the way. I'm not a phony. I'm not a fake character on here. This is who I really am. Um, I'm not even going to go there, Dan. And thank you, Kinky. This is who I really am. And I'm giving you my opinion. And that, look, one of the best attributes you can have in life is grit. The ability to get knocked down and get right back up again. That is one of the most winning attributes. If you can do that, you can do anything. If you can fall down or get pushed down or get kicked around, and stand right back up again and go get them, you can win in life. That's what I believe. I truly believe that. If you can get knocked down and stand up again, you will succeed. But you have to be willing to go out there and get knocked down. And you have to be able to go out there and experience rejection. You have to be able to go out and try to sell people communist newspapers and have 20 people in a row tell you to fuck off before somebody actually buys one from you. You got to go through that. I thank God for the day that I went out when I was 15 and I sold communist newspapers for the first time. It was a day that saved my life. And people say, well, that communist group was a cult. There was a cult, Caleb. They were exploiting you. You were going out there and selling a newspaper for a cult. No, it wasn't. That cult saved my life. It saved my life. I would not be alive right now if it wasn't for the cult that made me, as a 15-year-old, go out on the street and sell a communist newspaper to total strangers and learn to talk to people and engage with people and learn to be proud of who I was politically and learn to work with other people in a group, you know, and take that for what you will, you know. Um, you know, and I mean, people say that communist group was an awful cult and I, I critique their political views. My latest book is a critique of the communist group that made me go out and sell their newspaper when I was 15. And it ends with that very story. I am grateful, eternally grateful to Bob Avakian because when I was 15, his followers made me go sell his newspaper. If he had done nothing but that, if he'd been wrong about every other thing in his life, that alone makes me eternally grateful to Bob Avakian. As much as I disagree with him, I think he's basically an asset of French intelligence. I, I you know, in my book, I, I expose him. I rip his political line to shreds. But Bob Avakian, his people, made me go out and sell their newspaper on the street. They got me out of my shell. 
they got me into a movement. They didn't get me into an internet debate. They didn't get me into uh, an argument on the internet about communist history or about SimCity. They got me into a movement. And when I was 18, I moved out of my parents' house and I lived with RCP, Bob Avakian people, and we worked our asses off and we sold newspapers and we put up posters and we worked really, really hard. And I learned to organize and it was go, go, go. It was, we're going to go out and struggle. I thank God for that. Right? I thank God for that. And I go back and forth. I'll be honest with you all. I don't know. But in some communist circles, they refer to people who are not communists or people who are communists and stop being communists or people who have become communists when they refer to their old life. They say, before I was a communist, I was living biologically. Living biologically, meaning that you were alive in the biological sense, but you were not really alive spiritually. You were only living biologically. And the people who stop being communists, they go back to a normal life. Well, they, they're now only living biologically. I go back and forth. I don't know if that is appropriate. Some people say that's a little bit authoritarian, a little bit elitist. But in my life, it's absolutely true. Until the day that Bob Avakian's followers made me go out and sell their newspaper, I was only living biologically, right? And it was through joining a movement, through going out and doing outreach, through engaging with people, through organizing that I have become really alive and one of the main points of my new book, Letter to Baba Bacon, is that this is a spiritual thing. This isn't just a political question. And that Bob, you know, he makes such a big deal out of what a materialist he is. But this is spiritual. This is a very, very spiritual thing. Right? And that there's spirituality all over the communist movement, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. And part of the problem that we had in the 20th century was we denied our spiritual side. We said this was all material. Do you think Che Guevara, do you think Che Guevara gave up his comfortable life as a wealthy Argentine and went into the mountains to, to live in dirt and, and eventually get martyred for the cause of communism? Do you think he did that for purely materialist, rational reasons? I don't. I think Che Guevara, whether he knew it or not, had tapped in to the power of God. And I think that whether Che wanted to admit it or not, God worked through Che Guevara. Che Guevara was in touch with higher powers that motivated him to live for a higher purpose, to live for the sake of others. Che Guevara, and I believe, it, isn't, isn't it true that Che Guevara did admit in one of his diaries he believed in a Christian God? I thought I think he did, but maybe someone told me that. Maybe I'm wrong. But I don't. You don't get a Che Guevara based on pure materialism, right? You don't get a Mao. You don't get millions of Chinese students from the cities going to live in the countryside with the peasantry and mobilize the Red Army and give their life for the revolution. You don't get that for a purely material reason. There's something deeply spiritual about our movement. There's something very, very deeply spiritual about our movement. But we denied that because we were in rebellion against feudalism. We were in rebellion against corrupt institutions that existed, corrupt institutions that existed in the name of religion, in the name of God, the Catholic Church that burned people at the stake, that upheld feudalism and divine right, the, the you know, landowners of China that forced the peasants to bow before, uh, you know, statues, um, to bow before idols and, and such, and that we were rebelling. We weren't rebelling against God. We were rebelling against earthly authorities that invoked God's power to do evil. And that really, and this is what I talked about. If you go watch the Faith and Socialism workshop I did uh, out in Missouri over the summer, God was using us to destroy the idols. Communism was needed to destroy the idols, to sweep away the idols so that we could reconnect with the real spiritual power, right? When there's a corrupt institution that claims the divine right of kings, that claims 
papal infallibility, people are less connected to the real spiritual force that exists. When there are, are corrupt earthly authorities ruling in the name of religion, it, it holds back people's ability to have real spiritual experiences. And so it was necessary to sweep away the idols and that communism in the 20th century, the atheism was largely, it was, it was God was using communists to sweep away the idols so that we could reconnect with the higher power, right? If you read, um, if you read uh, Heroes and Hero Worship, a great, great book written by uh, the Scottish um, conservative writer. I really, really enjoy that book. I can't remember the author's name. But in that book, he talks about how all the great prophets of ancient times, right? Jeremiah, Isaiah, Muhammad, all of them destroyed idols. Why? Moses destroys the golden calf. All of these great prophets, and they're destroying idols. Why are they doing that? Why are they destroying idols? Well, they're destroying idols, he says, because those idols used to stand for something. He says, humans are not stupid, right? Nobody is so stupid that they think they can carve a piece of wood in their backyard or make a statue, and that's God. No one's that stupid. Nobody. That these idols were erected as symbols of higher truths. But after generations, people got into the routine of bowing and worshiping before the idol. And the truth that the idol stood for was forgotten. So the idol is there. It suddenly is a barrier to that real truth. So the prophet, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Moses, Muhammad, comes along and destroys the idol in order to reconnect mankind with the higher truth that does exist. That is why the prophet destroys the idols. And I believe that in the 20th century, communists had to be atheists because there were idols everywhere. But now those idols have been swept away. And now it is in the communist world that people are reconnecting to those truths. In Nicaragua and Venezuela and Russia and China, people are reconnecting to those truths where in the West, we are collapsing in liberalism, radical individualism, a society that says selfishness is a virtue and individualism comes before all else, that there is no real truth, that there's no point in life, a pessimistic outlook, an anti-human outlook. That is what has come to dominate Western society. The hopelessness and the pessimism and the cynicism of our age. Whereas it is in the countries that have broken out of imperialism that we find a love of community, a love of family, a love of nation, a love of country. We find that. We find that beauty in humanity and we find optimism and growth and the belief that tomorrow can be better than today. That is where we find it. We find it in the countries that have broken out of this money, profit-based system and started to build themselves up independently. So I hope that this has shed some light. These are my perspective on these questions. But I really do thank you all for watching. We're going to be doing a lot more streams. It looks like as, as much as I can, as much as my job and, and life permitting, I'm going to be doing two a day. So I wish you all the best. Um, it's been fun. Um, you know, I'm going to put on the closing music. And I will, tomorrow I'm with Angela. Tomorrow and uh, with Angela, chair of the Libertarian Party. Um, um, tomorrow, um, I'm with Angela and then, uh, I'll be back on Monday. Probably. I might even be back tomorrow night. We'll see. We'll see. It's been a wild, wild ride, folks. It's been a wild ride. To upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries 
have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today.